Nobody knows where you are mentally. That's for sure. <laughs> no, let's leave that alone. <laughs> yeah. I got depression, bipolar, uh, dementia, yeah. you name it, man. You put it in a blender. That's Eric. Uh, And we're back. Welcome. On our podcast, episode 50, as Colty keeps us in line. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, I don't know, we got like a couple weeks till Christmas. Yeah. I feel like I said that last podcast, but we're getting there. We're today's, today's the ninth. <clears throat> today's the ninth. Yep. This is airing on the, whatever. Have you done any Christmas shopping yet? <laughs> uh, some of my wife's gifts are right over here. I do. It always sneaks up on me. I don't understand why I think I have time and then it's like December 15th and mm-hmm. I'm like, Shh. I should get some stuff. Yeah, it definitely. Yeah, I, it's like certain ones are easy. Like kids are mainly done. Emily's done. Well, at yeah, this point. that's probably the the well, that's what's hard for me is I don't know who to get gifts for. Like yeah. I get gifts for my wife. That's easy. But yeah. I don't know like who's coming over for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Where are we going? You still get your parents gifts? Yeah. 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 Because I know we're going to see them at some mm-hmm. point. But like nieces our, and nephews. Yeah, we most of them. They we're having Christmas at our house this year. So, oh, so wow. I was told, and so is Margie like a big gift buyer or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like she's probably got taken care of. You just need to communicate. I basically take care of the Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. Keep it watered. Mm-hmm. Did you go and cut one down this year? Yeah, at Jed's house. Oh, that's right. He's got like a private stash. It's good to know, Forrester. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He just offered. He's like, "Hey, you should. If you need a Christmas tree, you should come over." I was like, "I do need a Christmas." Just call me right now. You come drag dragging behind like an oak tree. Shoot, he's calling me. I guarantee he's asking about cameras. Oh well, you're just dragging like an oak tree behind you. He's like, uh, "I meant like a Christmas tree." <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh yeah. yeah. He had a bunch of really nice trees. We went out to. There was one right there by our house, and we. Uh, I don't remember what it's called, but a Christmas tree farm. Mm-hmm. We went out and walked around and uh, for like an hour and couldn't find a tree over six foot tall. Really? So I was like, these are shrubs. Uh, we're, huh. we're leaving. You know, I thought it was interesting. Somebody else mentioned it. We were talking about uh, with Jeff Sturgis last week about planting pines. And um, I talked to somebody the other day it, from a uh, habitat side, right? It definitely seems like under pines, <laughs> under conifer trees is like a biological desert. But at least in Pennsylvania, and I don't know, probably Ohio too, it definitely seems like uh, some of the guys that I know that hunt Christmas tree farms or manage farms with, you know, a significant pines and low conifers kill some big bucks. Like yeah. they hold up in those, and, and I, I guess at this time of year it's thermal cover, but, you know, at other times of year I don't know why necessarily. Thermal cover? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I think it's just good, good thermal cover. Mm-hmm. So Co- I mean, covers cover, you know. And if they don't, you know, I think you're just gonna mm-hmm. migrate to probably wherever it's best. Given the, I see that a lot in like the north central part of Pennsylvania. A lot of, you know, pine tree, Christmas tree, spruce type farms that tend to hold a lot of deer, especially if they're adjacent to agriculture. And mm-hmm. so, anyways, um, so a couple of things. One thing that we're gonna try new. Uh, we always ask you appreciate you listening, subscribe. One thing that we're trying new is um, we're going to do like a giveaway every podcast week and uh, pretty simple, like essentially just comment on uh, if you're watching on YouTube, comment on it, like it. If you're watching on social, share it. If you're doing Spotify, I don't know, leave us a review. Same with Apple Podcasts. Yeah, just check in. Yep. We're just going to pick a winner every week. And I think at random. Yeah, at random for sure. And we just wanted to make it cool. And so like one of the things that I don't know why, maybe we just talk about it that much, but over the last few podcasts is we've gotten a ton of messages of like, hey, what's that grunt call that you and Jared use? What's that grunt call you and Jared use? And so like I use the original Primus Buck Roar and I can't find them anywhere. Oh, <laughs> speaking <laughs> this is, of which. This is the exact same one you have? That's the exact same. So yeah, that's the see, original. Mine must be a later version. V2. V2. So V2 is being sold in a lot of places, but the original is not. And I found a stash of like five of them and I bought them all. So this week's giveaway is the <laughs> is the original. Also, uh, added value, you get the can. The can. You get the cool. can. So, uh, yeah, if you want to comment, like, subscribe, share, we're going to pick a random winner, and we will send you an original. We're going to do it every week. Maybe we do stealth cams. Maybe we do something else. I don't don't know. We'll see what we can do. But, um, yeah, anyways, I'm going to give that away this week. And uh, we got two guests this week. Two dragons. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So Eric and Cody, um, Eric Long, Cody Altizer, that I've known these guys for quite a while. Um, you probably, if you've watched Management Advantage, you know, we've had Tom James on in the past. You know, Eric does a lot of stuff with Management Advantage. Drug, drumming Log is his consulting business. Um, you know, Eric also does real estate. And uh, Eric and I have been in the consulting game for a long time with each other. And, and it's funny that you can go and, and talk to some people like that. Cody's one that's kind of a little bit different beast. Cody's been behind the camera for a lot of the things that you would see from Eric. Um, but also, um, I know Cody did a lot of work with Jim Shockey um, and did some of those, like when you see like these crazy adventures, Jim Shockey's in freaking Afghanistan hunting rams or whatever, usually Cody was behind the camera for all of that stuff. So um, Cody's a really talented filmmaker and videographer, um, but also like a, just an intense passion for deer management and, and whitetail deer. He's a Virginia guy. And uh, I think him and his dad have a farm. We'll talk to him about that a little bit. So we've got uh, Eric and Cody on for this week. And yeah, let's bring them in. Hey, hey. Hello. How we doing? I already hey, saw you run in your mouth, Eric. You can't be doing that stuff behind my back like that. <laughs> it was recording on your end, even though. Yeah, it just, yeah we you know. captured it all, man. We'll just use it. We'll just use it later. Oh, yeah. They were acting like they were talking. <laughs> Um, Does it? We should figure that out. <laughs> I've got, I've got to limit the number of wisecracks at Eric, or at least pace myself. I've got several of them probably lined up at some point. But, uh, you know, well, listen, guys, we appreciate you coming on. Um, I, I wanted to kind of we we kind of gave a brief intro on on you guys, but um, I'm sure we did a probably a piss poor job at it. So I guess uh, Eric, let's start with you. Just give us some of your background. We told uh, kind of listeners about Management Advantage and Drumming Log, but um, you've been in this game. This is not an old joke either, so don't don't take it as such. This is more of an experience joke. You've been in the game of of deer management and land management for for a while. So so give us some of your background of uh, what you've got going on. Yeah, <clears throat> um, just like an overlay of what I do and all that stuff. Yeah, sure. Well. You got a lot of things going on. Yeah, too many actually. Um, yeah, just um, two thousand one. Uh, I created Drum and Log Wildlife Management. Uh, I've been doing that. This is our 20 year anniversary. So, congratulations. Happy anniversary. Yay. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I dabble in some real estate with Moss Hill Properties. And then, uh, of course, uh, the thing that keeps me upright is with uh, the gentleman on, on the other side of the screen, Mr. Cody Altizer with uh, the Deer Hunter Project. And um, yeah, there's things that we do there. And then, of course, I try to do as much as I possibly can, which I terribly fail at with the, the management advantage and stuff. But um, yeah, it's just uh, pick one. That's yeah. why it's, well, the it, it's all kind of a line, though. I mean, if you think about it, like everything that you look at, it revolves around, you know, mm -hmm. some sort of wildlife management and land management, you know, mm -hmm. focus, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, one thing I, I left out there, it's, uh, I've been, I've been working for the state agency, Ohio Division of Wildlife for about 25 plus years. So yeah, it's, um, such crazy train. And where, it, where are you in Ohio? Just cause I know Jared's an Ohio guy, so he's going to ask anyway. So I might as well get ahead yeah. of that. I'm in a, a county called Coshocton mm. and, uh, <clears throat> about an hour east of the, the land of $10,000 an acre properties. Yes. You bet, baby. That's you it. Look. Also, I think, um, well, it was either, it, I don't know if Coshocton was the leading county in, in firearms or not this year. I sent you the numbers last night. I don't think it listed by county, but yeah. yeah you think I would know that, but no. I, no. I, I, I feel like Coshocton's either uh, one or two. Yeah, it's know. Coshocton. What's the other one next to you that I can never pronounce? Muskingum? Muskingum. Muskingum. Yeah. Coshocton's uh, between where I'm at and Columbus, right? Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Right off 70. Yeah. Gotcha. Very cool. And Cody, I did a, a, a probably a piss poor job of underestimating your videography background, but um, elaborate a little bit more because I I think I first met Cody uh, probably when you were doing stuff with Shockey would be my guess, um, mm. which I don't know if that's been a while now or not. Yeah, I, I last worked for the Shockies, I think, in, in 2018. Um, I think I first started, they were really my first um, official professional gig in outdoor videography, which I kind of stumbled my way into that. And I was in way, way over my head and had no business doing what Aren't I was all? doing at the time. But I just kind of 
the old saying, you fake it till you make it. <laughs> Excuse me. So I started working for them, I think in 2013 and, um, yeah, I worked for the Shockies and, and Ivan Carter in between that yep. from 2013 to about 2018. And then since then I do a lot of work for, um, a private client out of Los Angeles, a trophy hunter who goes on all kinds of crazy, um, exotic hunts all over the world. Um, been working for him since about 2018 and, in in the middle of all that, do a lot of other conservation film work. Um, not everything I do is hunting related. A lot of the work that I enjoy doing the most is conservation and how it ties into hunting, not necessarily going out and just filming animals getting shot, which I don't, I don't mind, but I do like to do a lot of wildlife work where they're still standing upright at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and worked for, like I said, Ivan Carter, done a lot of conservation work for him, the Cabela's Family Foundation and the stuff Eric and I do. We've done a couple of film projects and yeah, kind of like what Eric does in, in wildlife management and land management. I, I kind of take a, a similar route with um, photography and film and try to center it around wildlife and conservation, hunting and the outdoors as, as much as I can and whatever road that takes me, I'm happy to go down it. And I think anybody that's, you know, seen either Ivan Carter or Shockey or even the stuff that you guys have done with the the Deer Hunter Project, you know, there's a there's a cinematography side of that that you bring into that mix that really tries to pull those people into it. And so I kind of want to transition that a little bit here and, and you know, uh, Eric or Cody, whatever, whichever one wants to kind of go through it. But, you know, I'm familiar with it, but but maybe tell the listeners a little bit about what the deer hunter project is um sounds very clean in terms of the name but it obviously has a lot of heavy meaning behind it go ahead Doug. yeah uh the, well the deer hunter project i mean it's um it's many <laughs> different things and it's kind of taken us a while to get some traction and figure out what we want it to be and what we can execute the best. Cause I live down here in Virginia and Eric lives up in Ohio and it's a six or seven hour drive. And we get together, you know, a handful of times a year to work on stuff, but between my schedule and as much as I travel and Eric doing half a dozen different things all over, it's hard for us to, to sync up, but yeah, the deer hunter project, it is, it is deer hunter, but it's deer spelled D E A R. And yeah, it's, you know, when we first started it, it was kind of built off of a short film that Eric and I did way back in 2017, which is hard to believe now. Um, and that film was called Deer Hunter, D-E-A-R. And that was that was a personal film for Eric and I, because for Eric, it, his son is named Hunter and his son was in the film. And I wrote the narration and voiceover. And that voiceover for that film was just kind of our message to the deer hunting, deer hunting specifically, but the hunting community in general overall. So we put together that film and kind of kicked around what we wanted to do next. It was like, well, let's, let's make this thing like an actual thing. So we called it the deer hunter project kind of building off um, the Genesis off of that film. But yeah, we, we have a podcast. We, we put together short films and in essence, you know, what we do, whatever it is, a podcast, a social media post, a short film, it is our message to the deer hunting community about whatever topic it is we're talking about. Yeah. Cool. Is that short, short film available on just YouTube or can people go and watch that? It is on YouTube. Um, our YouTube is the deer hunter project D E A R. Um, it's on our social media, uh, our Facebook page, um, deer hunter project on Facebook. It's on Eric's drumming log page as well. Yeah. Um, so if you go to drumming log wildlife management on Facebook, I think on his page, it's pinned at the top. So that might be the, the okay. easiest and best place to find it. But awesome. it, it is on Facebook and YouTube for sure. What would you guys say like at this point, uh, you know, have it gotten, is it a few years now under your belt with this project? Yeah, we started it in, it's hard to believe that too. Time flies. We started in fall of 19 and we were doing, you know, kind of cruising along pretty good. And then, you know, the pandemic hit and that kind of shut things down a little bit. And, mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, so we've been at it a couple of years and, yeah, so so at this point with that project, what would you guys say is like the the objective? Like what are you trying to do with it now? Um, what we're trying to do with it now is <laughs> I guess, you know, it, it's hard because there's so much content out there, you know, in, in the hunting and outdoor space. And, um, you know, so many people, I think they make the mistake of trying to do something different instead of trying to do it the best. Mm -hmm. So you have so many people going like, you know, running around in circles, trying to do all these different crazy things. And, 
I think that's kind of what we did at the beginning. Um, you know, like I think when we first started, we wanted to kind of spread this conservation message, which we integrate into everything that we do. But, you know, like, like Robbie Kroger at blood origins, like he does a really, really good job at that. Yeah. We know so Robbie. Like, I think he, they do the best at that. Um, so I, I think moving forward and Eric and I talked about this in the deer blind a couple months ago, back in October, it's, you know, we want to create content that gets people to like reconnect, or this is my goal anyway, reconnect and appreciate wildlife. Mm-hmm. Again, I think um, within the hunting community, we've kind of lost that. We always want to take, 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 go out and kill, kill, kill without really giving anything back. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, I kind of want to get back to appreciating wildlife. Yeah. I mean, do I still think that there's a, a lot of opportunity alongside Robbie who does seemingly more and more focused on, you know, his, his home country is, is he's from South Africa. And so I think he has a natural tendency. Am I right about that? Mm-hmm. Has a natural tendency to, to lean towards those, you know, African big game species and, and, you know, uh, what's known as tr- trophy hunting type of species and, and to no fault to Robbie, you know, uh, probably the largest demographic of hunters, uh, in the, in the U S is kind of overlooked and that's the, the white tail white-tailed deer hunter you know i mean that's kind of the mm-hmm. the closest to home that we have or can relate to as far as you know conservation and um, that's certainly where, where jeremy and i's hearts lie yeah I, I think an interesting thing and and eric we talked i don't know a couple weeks ago on this is that <clears throat> and jared and i had a conversation probably with dan schmidt i would assume it came across is that you know when i grew up hunting um it, it was still a lifestyle it was a passion it was something i did with my dad but like the deer camp atmosphere of things was what was so meaningful to me as a young hunter growing up like we bow hunted throughout the year and most of that was close to the house but essentially the day after thanksgiving here in pennsylvania we would pack up we would head north we would go to our camp we'd be there friday saturday sunday monday would be opening day deer season typically would hunt some of tuesday and then you come home and you know you had that five days of deer camp every year and i think you know two parts of that is Cody, like I get where you're saying about the wildlife side. And in fact, I think that some of that may has even, at least from a uh, whitetail standpoint, has increased. Cause I mean, I know how much money and effort I put into just managing whitetail, not only to hunt them, but just to like have them and watch them and manage them and to engage with them. But I think that the camaraderie aspect of hunting has completely fallen off the wagon at this Mm -hmm. point. Like doesn't doesn't even exist in in most states, especially a state like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or or Michigan. These these deep, rich, traditional states, you know. And I think Eric, I I even said something to you the other day. Like I feel like the deep South, if anything, has the deer camp traditions. Now we don't at all. Yeah, they're always ahead of the game with everything. And that's <laughs> the um, in the Midwest, we just we play catch up. Especially like, uh, you know, yeah, the hunt camps, you know, um, the clubs, um, you know, they, they were practicing QDM way before and actually doing it correctly. Um, you know, we took it and just, just <laughs> turned it into something that's almost re- unrecognizable. But um, yeah, it's just, yeah, I mean, the, our conversation the other day was really good reference, you know, the, you know, the deer camp mentality. Is that what's going to, fix everything. And I think it's a, a very good, you know, it's, it's part of the solution for sure mm-hmm. of getting back to, you know, I mean, we're 11.5 and fallen million people that are, are, you know, sportsmen in this country and next census, you know, whenever that is, it's going to be lower. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, we need to, and that's what like Cody and I are, you know, we were trying to accomplish and, you know, it's, it hasn't failed by any stretch of means, but, uh, yeah, just kind of relay, like we need to wake up and, you know, whether it's, you know, taking this road, this road, this road to fix this problem, at least wake people up, mm-hmm. you know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, uh, once or twice I've co I've heard Cody heard, we've heard it together that our, our content comes across angry. And it's like, if you're not angry, <laughs> I mean, shouldn't we all be angry about all this? Mm-hmm. I mean, What's it going to take you losing X, Y, and Z, you know, you go to the sportsman's Alliance, um, social media and every once a week, there's some tragic thing happening mm-hmm. and we just poop it. And, but we're too busy worrying about what saddle, you know, the buy on, <laughs> I mean, it's just, or whatever we're worried about uh, or yourself. And mm-hmm. that's not, 
And that goes back to the deer camp mentality where, you know, it's a family, you know, and now we're just a narcissistic one. But, you know, I don't know. That's I, a, I think it's, analogy, but. yeah, no. And I think it's interesting because um, I, let's tangent it there a little bit. The one thing that I thought, at least in the last two years since the pandemic is it seems it seemed like hunting numbers had jumped, you know, and I had a discussion the other day with Here, somebody. Let, let me interject because okay. I figured you're going to go there. Are you saying that the main issue, Eric, is that, that we have declining hunting numbers? Oh, we are. Okay. I mean, we're, we're, we have a shelf life. Okay. I mean, it's, there's no, it's ands or buts about it. And I mean, so when, when you're. When, so when you're saying like, okay. hey, we need to wake up and, and address or recognize this this thing, that thing is we're yeah. declining in hunting numbers. Yeah, declining in hunting numbers. And also, you know, just our lifestyle is not um, looked upon as, you know, good, yeah. you know, and, and it, it is. But we, we, we're the worst communicators, <laughs> you know, yeah. sportsmen are the worst communicators. Sure. Well, and so uh, not, not to put words in, in your mouth, but where Jeremy's going to go is that like, man, as, as bow hunters, people who spend a lot of time in the woods, you know, throughout the months of October and November, and certainly our minds are on it the rest of the year, uh, it certainly doesn't seem that way. Um, you know, we, we've probably run into more hunting pressure, uh, both on, on public, uh, you know, where we've gone and tried to do some, uh, some hunts like in Illinois and stuff, but also in our pursuit of, uh, property ownership, you know, it seems like competition from other hunters to buy land to hunt is like higher than than ever the, the in our lifetime anyways yeah. and so like on all these fronts it it sure doesn't seem like it is declining but you know i acknowledge that there's a census that states that it is and so that seems like a weird a weird kind of yeah uh, it's, it is weird it, and here's the thing and you know the pieces of the pie reference private land you know i i know back in the day if i i said it was just like maybe even 10 years ago if you don't own it or lease it you're not going to be hunting in this country. Right. Now I say, if you don't own it, you're not going to be hunting in this country because leasing and outfitting and stuff, it's just, it's insane, especially in the state of Ohio. Yeah. The price is going up and people are forced on public ground. Therefore, when you're out hunting, you see an increase of people. There's not more hunters out there. They're mm -hmm. just where you are, mm -hmm. you know, they're just, they're concentrating on certain areas where it does come across. Like, how can there be less hunters out there? Cause I, yeah, everywhere I want to go, there's some, there's somebody there. Dude, we couldn't, know? we couldn't have seen that more uh, like exact to what you're saying. And that I, I think a lot of people were in the same boat that you and I were this year, Jeremy, that we, we tried to apply for, for Kansas, that we've been very successful at drawing. Uh, and we didn't this year. Uh, and we mm -hmm. looked at the stats on that. I know we're not alone. Mm -hmm. I know that Iowa is also getting, you know, all these places that are, you know, pr pr promoted as, you know, big buck states, uh, that have a, you know, a, a, a limit to the number of people they like come hunt. All those people are then getting put, and we were one of them this year, get pushed into like the, the lowest the pools of like yeah, Illinois that's an over-the-counter state on public land where we don't have, you know. Same with Missouri. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and the thing with, with like COVID had, there, there was a spike, you know, yeah. with COVID. People going back, like realizing, and you still have with 2021, and we'll have it with 2022, and maybe a couple of years after that, people getting back to maybe their roots, if you will. Is that and, reactivation, Eric, more than it is recruitment? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. The and I think are. that's just for anybody listening. I think that's a big understanding there is like, cause I, I looked at some numbers and you know, they're not no knock to the state agency, Eric. Um, they don't have the most transparent data for us, but it did seem like there were certain States 20 to 30% increases, you know, from, from 19 to 20 in terms of license sales, hunting license sales. I don't think uh, everybody got real excited about that. I was one of the few who was not real excited about it, not because there were more hunters in the woods as much as it was, it was a false number, right? There was a, there was a false feeling of, wow, look at 30% more people came in and are now hunters again. It was like, no, no, no. Those people reactivated. They were hunters. They quit yes. because they got frustrated with it. They reactivated for a year, maybe two, and they'll fall back off, right? It's a yeah. false, it's a false increase oh, no. in the, in the community. Yeah, that's when we were seeing the numbers, you know, most a lot of state agencies were excited because of the financial, you know, sure. value of. And then obviously not to discount people getting back into natural resources from kayaking to anything, you know. Yep. Um, Cuz they didn't have anything but, else to do. They couldn't do yeah. anything else. Yeah, and then and you have okay, so you have a influx of people and that's, you know, again to go back, you see that out in the field, it's frustrating, you know. 
Um, I always like the comment of you know, the, the, the social media influencers out there and Cody and I, we kind of chuckle to ourselves occasionally like public land, public land. And the next post are like complaining that some guys following them around. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like what? But, yeah. you know, then so you have these people that are still, uh, you know, going the state into it. So mm-hmm. that's why like Wyoming and other states that, you know, like the point systems are kind of going up a little bit, sure. you know, because you have these people, it will come back down, you yeah. know, because people will catch up to their lives. They'll get busy again. And, and, you know, you always fall back to unfortunately bad habits and it's just, yeah, it's, it's a cycle. I mean, mm-hmm. it really is this whole thing. It's really, it's not difficult to understand, but it is very complex of things that people don't understand. And I'm fortunate enough to see behind the scenes on a lot of this stuff. Like, for example, like the Lake Erie walleye capital of the world. I think there was, and and I'm probably going to be wrong with the numbers, um, but you'll get the the point, even if I'm wrong. I think there was like 695,000 fishing license sold last year, uh, you know, fishing. And obviously because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Well, this year, I mean, it dropped almost a hundred thousand. Yeah, people just went back. Yeah, back yeah, to no, back to normal life. Yeah, yeah, just went back, and we have more fish, more walleye in that lake, Lake Erie than than ever before. You know, recorded. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, yeah, it's so. How do how do you recruit these people? How do we keep keep going? You know, how can we stay strong as a, um, you know, um, as a group? And I, Cody and I, we always Cody, please chime in. It's like we always talk of like. I mean, we have a couple projects, a little short video that we might be producing is that, you know, you represent me out there. I represent you out there. I'm not a duck hunter, but I, I you know, I'm a duck hunter, but I never duck hunt. I'm mm-hmm. a trapper, even though I never laid steel. You know, we, you are me and I am you. I'm going to support you. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be the, you know, I'm just a bow hunter and um, that's all I care about. Yeah. Can, can you um, let's spell that out for us, Eric? Like, why, why should people be concerned about declining hunting numbers? <sighs> Who pays for conservation? Hunters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have a little tax things here and there that the non-game community, the non-consumptive community, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to be here by any stretch, uh, you know, uh, bad-mouthing them, if you will. Sure. You know, um, that's not my intent because we, we're, we're going to need them. You know, well, we, we need to figure this out. But it's who's paying for conservation? Look at Africa. And mm-hmm. Cody can really chime in on that. It's like, you know, if the species X doesn't have value, you know, look what happens to the, the here's, rhino. Here's just a, like devil's advocate as we go. Like, could, it could it be said that, you know, uh, land privatization is like also – having a big impact on conservation. So me as a, of a private landowner, if I go out and I buy land uh, mm-hmm. and I invest into that land, um, mm-hmm. at some point, is there a, t- a tipping point where those private landowners who hunt and, you know, uh, practice conservation on their land can outweigh, you know, the funds that are given for hunting licenses and applied at like a state level? Well, that's the thing. It hasn't really caught up to this. I mean, usually state government and government in general, it's usually 10, 15 years behind the times. You know, it's, yeah. it's how can, if you're, if I'm terrible at everything they do. Yeah. <laughs> Generally speaking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like, uh, you know, CRP practices and yep. et cetera. Sometimes they're outdated, you know, it's like, what are we doing here? Right. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, okay, I, I, I suggest this to a lot of people, um, you know, throughout the country. I, I brought this up. And um, um, we have in Ohio, it's called CAUV. It's a, a property tax reduction. If you uh, farm more than 10 acres yep. or you have a forest management plan, it's property tax reduction. Yeah. So a lot of states are sitting there going, okay, so how do we, you know, continue hunting, giving access? Because it's always the elephant in the room, right? you know? Uh, access. Yeah, we want more hunters, but where do we put them? Well, you have farmers that are leasing out the ground, outfitting their ground. And I know it's you have to this point have to start thinking outside the box. The crazy ideas that you hear that you would normally roll your eyes out, you actually have to like, okay, let's let's dissect this. This might be a bad idea, but at least we have to have open eyes to it. But back to the CAUV, you know, giving a farmer $4,800, that's a short term solution to 
access. Right. But if you give the farmer a tax break to allow hunting and how the, the logistics of it, I don't know. But to give uh, the, the property owner a tax break to allow, the, you're going to see a lot of people go because that's a long-term financial thing for a farmer or somebody who owns land. Mm-hmm. It's things like that that you can think outside the box that's going to open doors up and relieve pressure off that public public ground. So I think know? one thing to to Jared's point and and you know obviously I'm 37 so nobody listens to me but like I've been screaming since I was in my 20s that you know here in the states we run from by the basically North American conservation model, right? And and it's been put in place for a long, long time, different than the European model, which is very privatization, right? There is no public land hunting in, in most of Europe, in Germany and stuff like that. You're on estates, <laughs> private lands, et cetera. It's the king's deer. Exactly. When you get to this side of things, we function different, right? It's North American, it's public resources, even though that deer is necessarily on your property, it's still a public resource, right? It's not your deer, it's it's owned by the people. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> there are pieces of that North American wildlife model that need updated per the way that our community has adapted from, you know, 20, 30 years ago where fence lines were there, but you just crossed them. Well, it's a, it's a strange overlay. And I, I don't, I'm not sure how it works in Europe, but like we can, we can buy land mm-hmm. in, in in the United States, you know, mm-hmm. you have the ability to go out and acquire more of these like public resources by a way of land ownership, correct? You know, or, or leasing, or you know, however you you acquire that. But you still don't own the wildlife on the right, property right, right. itself. Well, but what I'm saying is that creates kind of a weird predicament and maybe a wedge between private and public land uh, positions. Well, and I think that's where you start to look at, like, you know, I, I guess in that to finish my statement, it favors people who are financially able able to lock down those those land resources, because that's what gives you access. I to, mean, let's be honest, the more and more that we're doing this and this I'm not saying this is a bad way, because me personally, I, I have land and, and I'm managing land. But yeah. like the more and more we do this, the more and more we are very much European model at this point. Right. I mean, it's. Oh. We have, yes. we have, we've <laughs> yeah. gone, yeah, I mean, privatization of wildlife. That's where we're going. Oh, interesting. I mean, look at the state of Texas. What state of Texas is 90 plus percent private land? Yes. I mean, like yeah, but you're, Texas, European, it's owned by the state though, right? Not by individuals. No, no, no. It's owned by individuals, private estates. Oh, okay. Estates. Meaning you can't go, hmm. and Cody, you probably have more experience this than I do, but you can't go and hunt Germany unless you're like invited to hunt on an estate, essentially. <laughs> Yeah, I've only been to, I've hunted, well, I guess only Europe once in Spain, um, been to England and in Turkey, which part of Turkey I was in was, is actually Asia. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. It's spot on. And it's, it, you know, being over there and then coming back over here, it gives you such an appreciation and a perspective that makes me so thankful that we have what we have over here. Cause you see guys over there, the guides and outfitters that we hunt with, they're just as passionate like I was in uh, Turkey last September um, hunting red stag and the guides over there, I mean, they're just as into red stag as, you know, all us are into whitetails, mm-hmm. um, but they, they don't get to go hunt them themselves. I think they can bring in and that local um, village, I think they give like two tags a year and they always go to, you know. Well, see, but America. I think... So I probably know the least in this conversation, right. but I can have fun asking questions. So pr- the main difference that I see is like in America, we still have the ability to America, yeah, to 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 make money and to purchase land where these animals live. Correct. And it sounds like they don't have that in Europe or in some of these countries. I mean, most of the, most of the estate, yeah, they so, can buy it, but they still don't. Well, most of the estates are usually generation to generation passed down. Yep. Like I would assume. Again, I'm I'm not knowledgeable to it, but there's probably very few estates that go up for sale in Germany that somebody goes and buys this giant estate and now they're taking over the rights to it. Like it's a family inheritance passed yeah. down. Yeah. There's a prob- probably a real touchy question, <laughs> right, uh, you know, regarding like, because I can see, I can see benefit to a system that, you know, for, for people who want to work harder to, and I realize that's not the only way that, that money comes by people, but the ability to, to work harder, to make more money, to, to buy property, to hunt, you know, that's a, that's a positive thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm not saying that, you know, hunting should be reserved for those people, but it is a limited resource at the end of the day. I mean, every, every square acreage of, of land has been bought 
and there's only so many deer or you know whatever turkey whatever species you're wanting to hunt like it everybody can't do it it's, it's not possible the resource isn't yeah i think that eric's point where we talk about the so texas is one thing right 90 plus percent private but if you think about ohio or pennsylvania or wisconsin michigan wherever you want to look at the amount of land that is still owned by the state and or federal government that is managed by those entities that is not privately owned is so uh, huge compared to the privatization side of it that the two aren't aligned to take that model and say, well, we don't necessarily need license sales because we've got private landowners supporting the state on a landscape level. Well, and dude, the frustrating thing is like, you know, let's call it uh, Kansas and East. Yeah, there's a lot of public land, but like the hunting opportunity, as far as like the ability to go out and, and hunt unpressured, let's call it, let's say whitetail with a bow is, you know, all, is, is, it's small. Well, let, I mean, throw it's that small. divide out there to these guys. Like, would it be wrong to say that the North American model was more applicable to the Rockies and Western part of the country than it is to us at this point? Well, the thing about the North American model of conservation is that, I mean, we're, we're taking this thing and we're dissecting it, giving it this part and this part and right. this part. You know, look what, and I'm going to, I'm going to try my best not to ramble here, but Cody knows. That well. uh, it's, it's going, I was in a meeting not too long ago and there was a big giant attack on this model. And it was very shocking because it was a younger generation that was attacking this model. And, you know, the future of conservation, wildlife management. Mm -hmm. It was, it was eye opening and scary. And Cody heard, you know, the play by play with all that. And, um, they were wanting just to totally abolish this. And it was like, wait, wait a minute, look what this model, it's not outdated. We're just, it is outdated, but it's not outdated. I know that makes zero sense, but it's, we're, we're putting today's environment and our selfish views and saying, no, this is not how it's supposed to be. It should be this way. I mean, look what this model did. It brought back Canada geese. It brought back antelope. It brought back all this stuff. And if you don't have this model of conservation, who's going to pay for wildlife? See that the other side never has that answer. No, mm -hmm. you guys are bad. You guys are wrong. This model is outdated. But they, when you ask them, okay, all right, you know what? What is the other, I'm all years. How do we pay for conservation if I'm not in the play here? Mm -hmm. And so, I always so tell people, it's like, hey, we want the non-consumer <laughs> community. We want the non-consumer community. You know, hey, we pay the bills. They should pay the bills. Let's tax <clears> them <throat> on um, X, Y, and Z, the stuff that they use. And it goes to conservation. Be careful what you wish for, because guess what? They're at the table now. Mm -hmm. You've got to give them a seat at the table. Do you want them to have a seat at the table? Because more times out of 10, you know what? They're not going to, we're going to be a lot of debating. And there are a few we, states yeah. that have let them come to the table. Missouri is Absolutely. one, just because I know my wife worked for the Department of Conservation for a while. And, you know, the one thing that I'm quick to jump on for a state like Missouri is like, it is one of the most wealthiest state departments oh, yeah. because mm -hmm. they have a, a portion of the sales tax goes to the Department of Conservation. Is that also the reason they have, you know, the gun season the way they do and stuff like the No, then no, that's just kind of how it's always been from an because they're an opportunistic state as are most right. they're the 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 way that this and this is the evolution and this is why i say uh, you know model or not updates need to happen is that we as hunters have evolved from and i'm not saying eric and i we didn't argue over it we just discussed it but like we we want to kill big bucks it's there's no secret to that like i want to go out and i want to kill a big buck right mm -hmm. and i also want to enjoy hunting especially with my kids you know, 20 years ago, nobody, nobody out there said, Hey, I want to go kill big buck. Like, of course they wanted to when they were I out think there. Very few people even wanted to bow hunt back then. Well, it just in general, the, the first legal buck they saw, they killed and they paraded it around town. And so, and, and it wasn't necessarily even, I think from the meat side, were there more meat hunters back then? For sure. But we've evolved now to where we've taken this passion and it's, I don't, I'm not saying it's unhealthy because I love it. I live it 365 days a year, but we've taken this passion to where like I almost enjoy the management and the non-consumptive side of it, which I'm investing into these deer as much as I do the consumptive harvest of an animal. 
for for sake of or sake of like stirring the pot here, I guess like uh, I would say that's like in direct contradiction contradiction to like what a state like Pennsylvania does with its hunters. It's every state. Like so, you know, on, Eric, on one hand, you have Jeremy wants to buy land, improve it, you know, kill mature animals, and on the other hand, you have let's say the state of Pennsylvania. You know, no knock to those guys. They want to have as many hunters have opportunities as possible at deer in general. I mean, there's literally one state on public land in a lot of cases, which offers no real, you know, conservative benefit other than killing, killing a population. In terms of whitetails, there's like one state and it's Iowa. It's no secret that comes to mind that actually cares about making the age structure significantly deeper and older. And I say that lightly because I know antler restrictions have come into play in a lot of places, but that's getting deer to two years old, basically. Mm -hmm. I was the only state that I would say is at least mindfully saying like, ah, yeah, we'd like to probably have some four and five year old bucks in this thing. Every other state that I know of is opportunistic. Eric disagree. Yeah. Um, I think most states, if they were honest, obviously you having bigger deer brings in revenue, you know, um, if you have bigger deer, obviously the more attractive it is to sportsmen, they're going to come in and buy those non-resident licenses, you know, et cetera, and spend their money in, in X state. Mm -hmm. uh, so to say that, you know, we, they don't pay attention to it. Of course they do. But the thing is with politics, because politics is wildlife management in the state level, you can't just come out and verbally say those things. Sure. So when you don't realize, you know, maybe under the scenes, that's what we're, we're doing. Um, you know, you don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Mm -hmm. You know, some states are just better at it because of, you know, the deer structure, the deer, you know, the topography, it's, it's the huntability, et cetera. You know, the states that usually, what's always amazing to me, it's like you have Ohio and what's, you know, we are, we're a one buck state and look what we accomplish. There are 88 counties in this state and all 88 counties that you, you can, at least if you put your time in view a Boone and Crockett deer, a Pope and young deer, obviously, mm -hmm. um, you go to Illinois, that's a two deer, you know, look what they do. It's like, how in the hell do you sustain that? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, because it's all, you know, farmland, like, you know, blocks and stuff. You would think they would just eradicate them, but these things are persistent. Now you go down Virginia Cody, it's a good place, right? No, we're hard on them down here. It's, um, yeah, a very opportunistic state because it's two bucks. And that's just for my part of the state. Virginia is interesting because it's like three different states in one. Um, I live in the western part of the state in the mountains. We have a certain set of regs over here. And then in the Piedmont, I think it's a little different in the center of the state and then you go down to the coast it's a little different down there but yeah we have seven weeks of gun season um from the entire month of november is gone two weeks of muzzleloader two weeks of rifle they get a two-week break the first two weeks of december and then three weeks of late muzzleloading and you can kill two bucks and it's yeah we're it's it's crazy i i complain to eric about this all the time because you know so few bucks make it to maturity um around here and it's such a shame because even with how liberal the gun season is like every year they're really nice deer around here like 140 150 inch bucks and you know just think of what we would accomplish around here and there's not a lot of agriculture if any at all it's all mountain land and mm -hmm. we can still have these really really nice deer i think what we could accomplish down here if we kept the same gun season but we're only one buck or you were two bucks and cut the gun season in half Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like you, Jeremy. I mean, I, I'm not against gun hunting or anything, but, you know, more than anything for me now, it's like, you know, show somebody a mature deer, like out in the field or work in a scrape or a trail camera video of them. And like, tell me that's not like just a super cool animal. Yeah. That you just don't want to enjoy whether you want to hunt it, whether you want to just watch it, observe it, whether just, just knowing it's out there. Like that benefits <clears throat> everybody because they're they're so so cool. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's we're we're all well, hard on them down here. Well, here's the thing: what people don't understand with you know, we take our private land mentality and, and expect a state agency, whatever that is, to do the same. Agree. 
Mm-hmm. You know, every state agency has, you know, a mission statement. And it, and usually in everybody's mission statement is that the wildlife, that, you know, you know, it's for all citizens to enjoy. And, you know, obviously we pay the bills, most of it at least. And we feel that we should be, you know, in first place. And that's not how, that's not reality. It's not politics. It's not this and that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you manage deer herd? Let me give you some examples. We killed, uh, I think, close to 21,000 deer on opening day, which was, it's incredible in firearm season, you know, a couple weeks ago. I heard a bunch so, of those shots. What's yeah. that? My, I heard my of, neighbor killed a healthy percentage of them. Yeah, I heard a bunch of those oh, yeah, shots. Yeah. yeah. They're on but show. when you look, you, you put something like, hey, look what, look what you did as, you know, look, hey, we look what, you know, the praise. And all of a sudden you get, like I said, how do you manage this when you have a good portion of people going, I don't know. You guys are fudging the numbers because I'm not seeing them. Yeah. What are you guys doing with a, pl- uh, a ploy. You have the other part going, great. Good job. Now we won't have anything. Yeah. <laughs> good job. And then you have the guys that sit there and go, you know what? I got a great idea, you know, because all these uh, younger bucks are getting shot. How about we do this? How about if you shoot a year and a half, you can no longer shoot a year and a half. You should only shoot a two. And when you shoot a two, you can no longer shoot a two. You should be able to <laughs> shoot a three and a half. So you have, how do you manage? Yeah. You know, how do you manage a deer herd? Now, we have problems on our 100 acres trying to do what we can. Try to do it by a state agency. And everybody has a great idea. But how do you how do you get that great idea that you have into motion? It's not realistic. It's mm. just not how things are. And it's frustrating. And just as much as you are frustrated, most state agencies are frustrated, too. For sure. Because you have, you have all these things. And we forget that. And here's the thing, too. <sighs> Whose fault is it? As as I, I say the sportsman because you have disconnected from your state agency. Oh, for sure. Who's I'm... your deer biologist? Who's this? Who's your tra- who's your trapping biologist or, or trapper or fur bear biologist? Who's this? Who's your chief? Tell mm-hmm. me your chief or your division of wildlife or state game commissioner or whatever. Mm-hmm. We have back in the day, and I've said this to my bloom in the face, and it's annoying I hearing it even. It's like we disconnect, and it goes back to the deer camp mentality. When conservation clubs and uh sportsman's clubs were very strong you know what division of wildlife or whatever state agencies labeled they didn't need their approval to do anything but by god they went to those clubs and said hey gentlemen and ladies what look what this is what we're thinking what what's your yeah. thought you oh. went they went to you even though they didn't need your approval they wanted your approval you know because they needed your support and we have disconnected from that and we expect that they're supposed to do this stuff. No, they're running amok. Well, I think you know? there's, I think well, there's both like politics. So that doesn't sound like no, it's not sportsman. There, it's there, there's blame both no. ways. That let me here. I'll lay this out and then let's let's eat it up. Blame from the sportsmen, and this is no knock because there's some really good ones out there. Hopefully, we've had some of these on the podcast. But uh, the sportsmen have entrusted in influencers, social media influencers, YouTube influencers, whatever you want to call it, from a national level to provide them the information of what they should do in their locality. Okay. That's number one. Number two is, and there, this is not all of them because I know plenty of them that are great is I think that because of probably that first statement, most state biologists do not want to communicate with the hunting public. They don't, they don't want to go out there. They don't want to sit. They don't want to be the Gary Alts of Pennsylvania in the early 2000s who wore bulletproof vests and his family was given death threats every day because it is the most emotional thing to sit in a room with a group of hunters and essentially say, hey, here's what we think you should do. No, you're not telling me what the hell I'm going to do. That's So So there's, there's, there's blame both ways. Now, I will say that there are certain states that do a very good job from the biologist communication and transparency level down. There are other states, no knock, Pennsylvania, that doesn't do a great job at that anymore. And so I think that there's blame on both parties. I don't know who started it necessarily, but this is the place that we're both in. I do think that there is a lot of, and the four of us cannot argue against it, there is a lot of shitty advice being thrown out there on the internet from a national level that these guys are consuming at a local level and saying, well, so-and-so said I should do this. So this is how the way it should be on my piece of property in Pennsylvania. No, no, dude, no, you can't. That's not right. 
it's so managing wildlife you would think it'd just be very easy you know pretty simple and as you get more politics involved in it and the, and the personnel that are that are being hired yeah, I mean, it's not a secret. At the state level, we are hiring less and less people who actually live the hook and bullet lifestyle and more and more people who live the conservation biology lifestyle. Well, we talked to Craig Harper about this yeah. a couple weeks ago. And ultimately, it does seem like managing wildlife is fairly straightforward. It's super. It's managing people that's like the challenge. There you go. Boom. Yeah. Well, that is what screws it up. Yeah. And because admittedly, you know, as Hunter, even in this group of of guys here you know we, we want different things potentially you know like i want crossbow season so that i my nephew can do this and that or not, or i want a limited s season for like we all want different stuff yep and so like i can understand why a state representative could just throw their hands up to be like well I, tell me what you guys want i don't know like yeah, but, my job's to manage wildlife <laughs> yeah but at the end of the day that person and, and it, it is it's so different amongst different states like i mean here in pennsylvania the state legislature makes many of the major decisions which is out of my mind crazy because they don't know anything the biologist does do they get to provide the recommendations sure but they can't make the decision on most of these statements and it's it's mind-blowing that politics drives that side of it but I think to Eric's point, there is a there's a line in the sand there from the sportsman angle that we can control. Um, and unfortunately, there are there are things. I mean, hell, I watched a debate the other day between, you know, people saying that you shouldn't plant brassicas because they're going to poison your entire deer herd to somebody saying it's the greatest late f f season food source that ever existed. And it's literally in the same thread that one person's telling me it's going to kill all my deer and the other one saying it's the best thing that could ever happen to deer. And it's just, you know, it's because people have said different things about that that has essentially got into this general hunting public. It's seeped in, into our veins, and now we're sitting there arguing with each other about it. Well, I'm sorry to keep jumping in here. D doesn't it seem like just as long as the state agency is clear about their goals, you know, us as hunters and as individuals should be able to make decisions about how, you know, we react to that. An example being... If we know that Pennsylvania is open about the fact that they are for hunter access, not necessarily mature age class whitetails, mm -hmm. me as somebody who wants to hunt mature age class whitetails would say, okay, you know, public land's probably out because the state's not going to do anything for me there. I'm going to try to purchase private land and manage it the best that I can for that objective. Yeah, but you're never going, I mean, on a landscape level. And again, and vice versa, think about Iowa the guy. is going to have some of the best public land because of the way they, they manage it. Uh, from opposing. 100 numbers well, the thing too is you know back in the day a lot of state agencies had uh, had these hearings at the end of the season and then also to introduce new bag limits new this new mm -hmm. season dates etc and it would allow the public to come in and they used to come in by the bus loads and it was the most entertaining thing in the whole world you needed popcorn it mm -hmm. was incredible the yelling the screaming wildlife officers escorting people out <laughs> It was incredible entertainment, but, and obviously, you know, it was like, okay, we need to, we need to solve this because it's just, we're not accomplishing anything. So they went to, you know, basically, Hey, let's go online. And when you went online, it just dropped. Yeah. Like, Hey, we, we have the season date. And then, you know, what, what do you guys think? Well, and, and that, maybe four or five people, four or five people yeah. might engage in it and that's it. That's it. But then when you go on social media, you have the social media keyboard people sit there and just like hey blah 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 blah. it's like wait a minute you had an opportunity to voice your opinion why are you voicing your opinion on just your social media page the ex state agency gave you a a, a thing and, but you you weren't strong enough to do that then mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make any sense but here's the thing with um you know with cwd and all all this other stuff that you know we deal with uh, as sportsmen Wildlife management today is up is down, down is up, left is right, right is left. And once you understand all that and come to grips with it, your life is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. If, I may, if see how confusing all that is, yeah. that's that's you know why as a consultant and everything else, I mean that's my that's the world I live in. And here Cody and I, the quiet one of the bunch, <laughs> this is what we're trying to do with the Deer Hunter Project. And this is why it sometimes it falls on deaf ears. It's like, wake yeah. up, people. Look what we just talked about in, a, in a whatever amount of time we've talked about. 
I don't know if we solved anything, but you know what we did? We brought awareness to a lot of things and gave people different side of the story. You know, um, mm. I, do I strongly believe it's a sportsman's fault for things being absolutely not, but I want to put that grain of sand in your mind and place that seed so it can grow, mm-hmm. you know? So we got to bring up other ish, things that we don't think about. And sometimes we have to look ourselves in the mirror and blame ourselves or fix it, you know, first. And it goes back to the deer, the deer camp thing, how this originally started uh, to Jeremy. It's, it's, you know, we're focused on our kids and the youth. We, and that is our future, of course, but we got to fix ourselves. And is it by, you know what, just kill what you want to kill. You know, were things a lot better when QDM wasn't around socially? Yeah. How were, how are you? let's be honest for a second. Okay. Do I feel this? I don't know. As a consultant, I'm going to tell you no, <laughs> you know, but were you happier before QDM as a sportsman? Probably. Yeah. Because you did other things, right? Yeah. You score hunted, you rabbit hunted, you did this, you went to, you trapped, you, you dabbled in this, you did this, you did that. And then QDM, it was the most incredible thing to, uh, to all of us, all four of us, even the, you know, it, it, it was awesome. But did we take it down a road that it shouldn't have been? I don't know, but I tell you what, sitting in a tree stand, passing up 160 inch deer, because I'm a wildlife consultant, and for me to shoot 160 inch, 60 inch deer, you know what? What will people think of me? You know, I have to. I, you have this pressure on you. I seen a two year old the other day. He might have scored 90. I wanted to whack it so bad. You know, <laughs> I wanted to stick an arrow in it because it was such a quality hunt. It was so much fun. Yeah. Back in the day, Dad. Oh, it would have been awesome. I mean, you follow what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. it's just. Well, I think Jared and I talked about that the other day, even with our own properties. And it's something that I, you know, I still haven't found the happy medium with. And it's, you know, my wife and my family want to enjoy the properties we have. Right. That said, we lecture on it podcast after podcast that the number one killer of a big buck is pressure on that, on that property. Right. So how do I balance use of that property for life and enjoyment in use of that property to try to kill a big buck? Like there's a, there's a point there that they don't coexist because if I want to go and hike with my kids up through this property and like, you know, go and look for arrowheads or whatever it might be in the same breath, I'm pressuring the hell out of it to where that's not favorable to my goal of killing a mature buck. Like it's going to bump them out of there. Put the, the, with that being said, what you just said there, I had a, I had a, um, a guy, potential client call me, this is years ago. And I, I just remember it like it was yesterday. The guy calls and says, hey, I had X uh, consultant at my place and uh, it's 200 acres. Okay. And I have, uh, I think he said four or five kids. And the consultant said, for me to shoot big bucks, I have to stay off of it. And that's to your point, right? Yeah. And he said, so my, my, my question to you is how do you feel about that? And I'm looking at another hundred acres just to be able to take just that piece of property, just to take my family to use. And I said, listen to what you just said. You have 200 acres, of piece of property. You have four or five kids and you're going to go spend another three to $400,000, probably a half mil. So you can take your kids hunting. Mm-hmm. What are we doing here? Yeah, no, I what are agree. We doing here? We, we, Am I the only one that feels like, wait a minute here, man. Mm-hmm. Is that big buck worth more than taking your kids out hunting? Is that big buck worth $500,000 for 100 acres in Coshocton County, Ohio? Yeah. What are we doing here? Yeah, it's, the, it's here, a say, question. Yes, come to me. But that's yeah. just, you know. But it's the question yeah. that we continue to ask ourselves because, like, I, you know, I, we talked to, um, who was it? Sturgis, I think, was telling us about a client that he had the other day. And it was one of those things that he got into the property. And and given the four of us love management, right? I, I think I probably spend more time managing and, and just being on the property and, and trying to improve the habitat than I do hunting. But he basically saw a gradual decrease as he did more management of the quality of deer and the deer sightings on his property because, frankly, he was just using it. Right? He was putting more pressure on it. He was managing it. He was making the habitat better. But his presence of being out there and timber stand improvement and planting food plots and driving here and doing this and doing essentially got those deer to like, whoa, this isn't as 
desolate of a of a pressure place as we've seen in the past. Well, see, I tell my clientele this: it's like there's carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is how much uh, sure. you know habitat can withstand a uh, population, i.e., you know, white-tailed deer. But then there's this thing called social care, uh, carrying capacity. It's a made-up thing; might not make sense, but is how much can you withstand? Now, if I have 200 acres. And if I do all the things that I'm supposed to do, my chances of killing 180 to 200 inch whitetail are pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. But how much can you withstand? Do you like seeing a lot of deer in a tree stand? I do. So there, your 180, 190 just dropped a little bit. I have kids. I only have one, but I'm just using a general thing. I have kids. So you know what? My 180, 190 just dropped even a little bit farther. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So your expectations and what your goals are, it's a social thing. How much can you withstand? Yeah. You know, those Shaquille O'Neal's out there, the, what the freaks that like, you know, laying on your table right there, you know what I mean? They're few and far between. Yeah. And the only way is strike everything, property. Apparently the internet said they, they just censored Eric. They're pretty darn good. But you want to enjoy it. You pay for it. You have kids that want to go out there and ride their four wheelers. You got kids that want, you know, your wife. Your Wi Fi is kicking on us a little bit there, Eric. Different line. You know, makes sense. Sorry, uh, Eric. We lost it on your Wi Fi just a little bit there. We got kind of the, the general scheme of what you were saying, though. Just assume it was some great knowledge. It I was. Know I'm it sure was. it was. I was I, absolutely. It was almost all the Leopoldish. I am. I am. Just know? shed a tear. Well, so I did. I just, <laughs> Cody, what do you think? <laughs> no, I. Yeah, that you guys made a lot of good points. I mean, it's it's something that it's a generational thing. You know, with my dad and I on our property. You know, I I remember when I was a kid. The first thing I did when I got home from school during the fall was to grab my 22 and go squirrel hunting. Mm -hmm. I'd walk around, I'd shoot squirrels. Um, during the summer, first thing I did, I'd hop on the four wheeler and just ride around the roads and go and look for deer. Back then we didn't shoot or see as many big deer as we do now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, at the end of the day, like you're in control of where your mind goes and you just got to set forth your expectations of, you know, it's like Eric said, do you want to kill the biggest, baddest, oldest deer? Like, yeah, you start at the top, but what are you willing to sacrifice? Um, mm -hmm. you know, like I got a nephew, he's two, if he wants to go hunting, like, you know, the first time he goes out, he can probably shoot whatever he wants. That might be a year and a half old. Sure. So, you know, whatever the maximum capacity of a deer can be around here, just say 160, we start there. Well, you know, like Eric said, you, you check off these boxes and it gets a little you know, smaller and smaller. Um, so it's, yeah, you, you just gotta be honest with yourself and, you know, it, it, the Gandhi quote is cliche as it is, but, you know, be the change you want to see. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you get all bent out of shape about people getting too worked up about, you know, um, being all over their property just to kill a deer, like, you know, at the end of the day, it is just a deer. Like I, I go at it as hard as anybody I know. And, but, you know, I, like last year I was after this super nice deer and the neighbor killed him and it sucked for like a day and a half. I mean, after that, hell, there'll, there'll be a bigger deer this year. There'll be another one next year. So I don't know. I think, um, I think a lot of times, you know, we get so wrapped up and like Jeremy, you guys said, it listen to the social media influencers and they say X, Y, and Z. So we try to do it exactly that, but, you know, turn off YouTube, turn off the podcast, turn off TV and just whatever makes you happy, like go do it. If that's killing a 200 inch deer, like do whatever within your means to do that. If you want to enjoy the property with your kids and, still want to kill a deer like alter your expectations as such but i don't know i think too often we look for somebody else to tell us what to do and how we should act instead of just like blocking mm -hmm. it all out and doing what makes us happy well and i say that lightly too because you know i think it's the um the way that things are revealed to us via today's social media streams or internet or whatever you want to call it uh, it almost instills false hope in some cases, like, you know, obviously no naming names, but like I see, I follow several of these people on social and it's like, like every week they're killing a giant buck, <laughs> you know, and it, it, it's and Jared knows, like, I mean, I've had a hell of a season. I've got all my tags still in my pocket, though. My youngest killed his first year, which and a buck, which makes my season. 
the fact is, like, I'm watching these guys jump state to state to state, and every state they hunt, they kill big buck. Now, that said, they're also likely hunting outfitters. They're they're on thousands of acres of well-managed property that probably has zero pressure because the family doesn't have to use it. It's part of their business is to kill big bucks. And so, but but as you see that, man, does it, it's, as, as a deer hunter, you can't deny that that doesn't creep into your mind and say, like, what, I told Jared the other day, I'm like, dude, what the hell am I doing wrong? Like yeah. these guys are obviously all killing bucks and like I'm out there doing it and well, I'm not. And dude, whether, whether we like it or not, like, <clears throat> you know, what the consultant told that guy is what the guy paid him for. You know, he, the consultant's not saying, well, listen, as an individual, like you should really put your family first and, sure. and this and that. The guy's paying him to say like, hey, how do I kill a, a, a booner on this property or whatever? And so he, oh, yeah, absolutely. he's not wrong in saying like, hey, the less pressure you put on this property, the better your chances are. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I'm torn on that, that very thing, Eric, because I love my family. That's right. The, and I, and the, I value these experiences, but I also want to kill a giant buck. And so yeah. like what I've had to do, I just, when I did this last year, I killed my, my first booner 10 minutes away from my family farm in Ohio. And it took me a couple of years of hunting that with several close friends to realize it ain't going to happen here. And so I am, fo I'm, basically forced with, okay, I kick everybody off and just manage the crap out of this piece and lo lose that whole element of camaraderie and, and all that, but I'll kill a big buck there or, and this is what I elected to do, keep it exactly the same way. You know, I, I don't want to lose any piece of that. I want everybody to enjoy it maybe even more. And so I went out and found permission property 10 minutes away. And so when I killed that buck, you know, I, I did it in a way that wasn't affecting my property at all. I didn't touch and didn't hunt it at all. In fact, I re removed myself from the equation. So everybody had a better chance to kill, you know, a deer. And I still was able to kind of come back and celebrate with everybody and, and have that, have that camaraderie. And so I kind of got to have my cake and, and eat it too, but. Well, but it's also because you don't use that other property at all. It literally is yep. get in, get out, get it's in, a, get out. Yeah, that's, that's a it. big buck. Pro that's what it's for. You know, and so to that guy who's asking like, should I buy another hundred acres? You know, it, if you have the money and if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Sure. I'm not, yeah. Look, I'm like I said, I'm want to give like today is just a different perspective as a, as a, you know, a consultant, as a professional, obviously when someone hires me, we're going to do whatever it, you know, yeah. realistically yeah. what we, that we can do to get it done. But at the same time, as a conservationist in me, as I get older, you know, I'm starting to see the other side where I did yeah. have blinders on yeah. and that's all life was about. We I have remember to. being 30 years old and just, I was obsessed, man. I didn't yep. see my kid grow up. Uh, I missed a lot of things, missed a lot of games. My wife, I mean, it was strain on my marriage between consulting, being on the road and hunting everywhere. It was, it's amazing that she's still with me. Well, I, but it's just, I think Eric, so that, that is a super valuable aspect to like what you offer as a consultant. Cause Jeremy and I have both had those blinders on just like all that matters mm -hmm. is like big, buck, kill yeah. big buck. Kill. And then, so we're missing, you know, family stuff. And, it, but it goes back to what Cody was saying. It's like, you got to do you, yeah. you know, where yep. you, whatever, where you are. And I tell clientele it this, it's like, you cannot base your accomplishments on anybody else. It's the old Teddy Roosevelt thing that I stole off of them. Do what you can with what you have, where you're at. I yep. can't judge my, my accomplishments on, you know, any of you three. Yeah. But society I, has, you don't know my financial business. You don't know where I am mentally. You know, which is pretty disturbing. Nobody knows where you are mentally. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> no, let's leave that alone. <laughs> yeah. I got depression, bipolar, uh, dementia, yeah. you name it, man. You put it in a blender. That's Eric. Oh, but it's this. Yeah. I mean, I have 560 acres of property. You would think I would be killing 200 inch white tailed deer every year. Cody can contest. It's the worst. It, it's very, it, I'm wrong. <laughs> it's this, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's so frustrating as a consultant that why am I not doing this? And I put more into it, more of myself into it. And the more draining it is and more frustrating and more, I want to walk away from this. That's why I got a, a bird hunting dog. What's your limited resource? I mean, what, what do you think, what do you think is, is causing that? Why isn't it good? Where I tell you, you what, are you in Coshocton County? County? What's that? Where, where's your property? Which, which one are you uh, talking South about? South of me, Muskingum County. Which is pre, I think pr the primo. Thing is it's, what's that? It's primo country, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. The topography is terrible. The soil's like asphalt. And, uh, <laughs> but the big thing, but the big thing is, it's like, 
<laughs> I have to blame myself if I'm honest. Yeah. Because I'm I'm 47 and I have the mentality now where I just want to, I, I don't know what I want. Yeah. Do I want to kill a 200 inch white tail? Of course I do. But do I want to be, I don't have the energy anymore to put into it. Yeah. A lot of it is my fault. You know, plus all ties are there. They oh, all yeah. come down and help you. No, where's he at? <laughs> where's he? At? He's in Virginia. <laughs> he's in, I'm in he, Virginia hunting 120 inch white tail. Uh, you know, yeah. taking pictures and he's in on social media. It's he's sitting on a mountain in Turkey, you yeah. know, filming Red Stag or something. Yeah, yeah. it's like I'm in a turkey today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's like the limiting factor. I have to look myself in the mirror. Now, if I was 30 years old, you know, that that guy, oh my gosh, who knows what would happen? But I'm 47, you know, I've seen enough death in my yeah. life well dude no i think that's i think that's yeah. a really good point though and and not to like rabbit hole down our, all of our personal routes is like that county in that state is something that is very much looked at as like man that's just it you got you have a piece of ground there you're gonna kill a big buck clearly that's not the case no not at all yeah you could have 20 acres and kill you know big deer in a state of ohio yeah, you know, if it's in the right. It's just, if it's the right piece of the puzzle. Yeah. I have 560 acres, and it's not the right piece of the puzzle. Yeah, you know, you have to work harder. You know, and I have all the access, you know, in the world of equipment to make things better and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know, it's frustrating. I mean, mm. it's sit there. It's like, it's it's defeating. It really is. I and feel then, your pain, uh, Eric. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really mean, do. Jared's got a thousand acres and has the same struggles, essentially. Maybe not that yeah. you have asphalt for soil, but yeah, I mean, it's decent. Yeah. It's just old pasture ground. Yeah, it's just the, um, the big deer aren't there, you know, in late yeah. October, and November. They're just not. Yeah. Yeah. It's this, uh, it can be frustrating, but at the same time, you know, so I, you know, personally, you sit there and go, then you go on social media. And, you know, even though Cody and I preach, you know, social media aspect of it, don't fall prey. Of course, you, it, it's human nature to fall prey. Yeah, you know why? Why is whoever killing these big deer? You know, and then you say things like, "Well, you should come hunt my place. See what you, you wouldn't be, you know, doing that." And there's a lot of truth. Can I that. use that as a pivot point? Just because I know that uh, it's been eaten at me, and and this is not to like divide the hunting culture, the deer hunting culture, but like that quote right there is what I'm hearing more and more from the public land guy. Like if I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kill, but frankly, I was trying to kill a 200 inch deer in Columbus, Ohio this year, and still I'm trying, um, you know, the first thing I hear out of someone is like, well, you should try to do that on my public land where I hunt. And it's like, what the hell, man? Like, it's literally like, uh, it doesn't even make sense. Like, is it, a, is it, and, it, and I get it. Maybe it's some envy or jealousy and listen, that's not, I mean, we hunted hard on public land in Illinois and we got our asses kicked. Like, well, but, dude, the, the, the the reality is that generally speaking, like deer just it killing a big buck just depends on like where you're hunting. Like, yeah. you know, we yeah, say, I'm we say it a hundred times, but like you can't kill a big buck if they're not there. Yeah. And even if there are there, you're gonna have an even harder time killing them if they're, you know, getting pressured every single day. And not that I'm not like up for a challenge, but like what I wanna do is kill a mature unpressured deer if i could you know and that's really really hard to find but like th that's the most thing f fun thing to, to me you know and it's maybe there are harder things to do but like there's lots well, of hard things that i don't and it's not do. it's not to throw the public land guy because again we did it this year i'll do it every year just because i don't have property in every state to hunt and i want to hunt other states so i'm going to hunt public but like th this this concept of well, I'm hunting public because it's a challenge. Like, that's why I'm doing it. No, you're not. You just don't have anywhere else to hunt. <laughs> I mean, it, am I wrong in saying that? Uh, there are probably some guys that are like, well, you no, know. No, there's not. Dude, if no, you so have. Here's the thing with that. You're hitting, you're allowing yourself to hit a ceiling. How about just be, God, ah, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to say something really bad. Well, no, no, no. But still, oh, like, wow. if you have 200 acres of ground in Ohio, private acre ground. You don't say, well, I'm going to go hunt this public because it's a challenge. No, you're not. I'm sure, I'm sure there are guys out there. No, there's oh, no, 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 no way. I, the thing. I, there are some guys. There are 100%. Here, well, maybe sure. not Ohio, but yeah. like Iowa, where I could kill multiple bucks. I'm sure there's a guy that owns land that's like, in okay. uh, In Iowa. In Iowa. Yeah, so he gets three tags. A and he's owner. hunting it because it's a challenge or because there's yep. a better chance at bigger deer there? I, I don't know. I don't know. A challenge, I guess. No. 
No, no freaking way. Sure, guys, here's, here's I know some problem. people who do it for the challenge yeah, around I'm, here for sure. I'm sure. Dude, if I lived in Iowa and I could kill three deer and I've done so for the past 20 years with a stick and string because I own a great piece of ground, maybe. It's a very small number of people, I'm sure. But So, Cody, those people that you know have access to Virginia land, they're just saying, well, for a challenge, I'm going to go and hunt public land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Wow. It's just a different they, goal. They have access to private. And it's, I mean, by no stretch of the imagination, like it's a good <laughs> private property. Yeah. But around here, I mean, we have a lot of national forests, a lot of for public sure. ground. And well, and dude, I think Appalachian Mountains, I mean, it's, it's a, and I've never done it, so I can't really speak to it. But yeah, I mean, people, they like to hike yeah. in for two, three, four miles, set up a tent and do the whole, you know, Eastern backcountry yeah. white tail. Well, dude, and that's just part of like, we have to acknowledge, and I definitely acknowledge that there's not everybody hunts to kill mature whitetails with a bow. Sure. There's lots of pe I agree. people, guys just want to experience the public land challenge. And that's great. Like, that's cool that people have hey, a goal that they're doing, you know? Can we all just get along? Yeah, I, I'm not saying. Uh, listen, because I hunt public. In fact, I've got I've got a large chunk of property in Kentucky that borders Daniel Boone National Forest. Well, see, and I will hunt that. Hold on. The other tone of what you're saying though is that your goal is you want to kill mature bucks, a mature deer, as is mine. And so you wouldn't, in your right mind, say, "I think I'm gonna." I'm going to hold it. I'm just public land is how I'm going to do that. No, if I say that I want to do a challenge, I'll go to a recurve or a longbow or like this year, I'll hunt uh, instead of using my inline muzzle or I'll hunt with a flintlock because I think that's a challenge and it's it's fun as hell. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to necessarily hunt a completely different piece of property when I have perfectly good access. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, I think everybody's actually correct because, you know, I see where, where Jeremy's going. Um you know, I think like the guy who says, well, I got, I got, I'm, I'm stuck at, you know, public ground. Are you stuck at public ground? Really? You, you gave yourself a ceiling uh -huh. because how about not show up at someone's house and camouflage and look like you haven't taken a shower in three weeks. 100%. Okay? And knock on the door, you know, no, it's your, no, you're the limiting factor there because the place that I have. Okay. You and know, so like, in fairness to Eric and an extreme version of that, make some freaking money and go buy a piece of property where you can buy, where you can hunt these deer. Oh, absolutely. Same thing, right? Yeah, so it's just, so it's, it's, but there, I, I would think that there is a portion of the population out there that's, you know what? I mean, I think we should start a new craze and put it all over social media is the, the public land challenge, man. I mean, how, how many, you know, I, and I'm making fun and I'll bring up his name. It's like Don Higgins, you know, he's a very good, you know, he's a hell of a bow hunter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much, how many 200 inch deer have to fill up your heart, Don? Go out there to public <laughs> ground. <laughs> he, he's you know, still I'd say that all obviously joking. It's sure. like, you know, I, yeah, I'm just jealous. But um, yeah. yeah, it's just, yeah, it, it, there's so many sides to it. Because if you say oh, I'm, I'm limited to public ground, are you really, man? Well, but I, mean, I, and I also say the challenge side of it, because like, I don't care if you have 500 acres and in your area, Eric, like it's still a challenge to kill the buck that you're after, whether it's a specific deer or a mature deer or whatever. And so why I say that is because I feel like lately to the point of like, listen, I hunt public land. I've got no problem if you only hunt public land, but I feel somewhat attacked in that if I'm either buying land or I've afforded a lease for property and I'm dumping a lot of money back into it to manage it, that it, for some reason, it's not as challenging as you hunting public land. That's how I feel. There's plenty of people out there that have, have just openly said, well, you hunting public, you not hunting public land. Like I basically I'm a better hunter. Well, it's, it's not in fairness. Like it's not as challenging, but you're not seeking that challenge. Like, like I think that's the discussion. You're seeking the challenge of hunting an unpressured, mature whitetail buck. That's what you want to do. I want, yeah, and even if he is pressured, the I challenge don't care. I just want to kill the mature buck. Yeah, the challenge that they face on public land is like, okay, so now just open that up to 20, 30 guys and let them walk all over your property and now try to kill them. Yeah, it's going to be a lot harder. Yeah, impossible. Yes. I'm on Team Jeremy here. I'm, I agree. I'm but, like, um, I just, and I'm not saying it's this the same thing. I mean, it's a challenge. No matter what, if you have it, you have control over it. That's about it. But if it's junk ground, <laughs> in and some cases, factors, except for the trespassers, know, lack of equipment, lack of finances, because you spent all the money on land. Yeah. I mean, you have a demanding wife, you, you, you name it. 
man. It's just these factors that we don't say out loud that's making you know things challenging. But mm. but I mean, on the other side, I, I do see the other. I've side. killed I've killed several mature bucks on public land. I've also killed several non mature bucks on public land. I'm not yeah. I'm not. What we should throw out as a disclaimer, like th there is definitely still opportunities to kill mature bucks on on public land. In fact, I mean that deer came off of public land. That deer is on public land in Kansas. Um, I killed a 157 in Kansas on public land two years ago like yeah that deer was on public land that deer lived on public land like there's plenty of yeah we're rattling the hell out of this thing that deer was on kansas public land a hundred yards from a parking area like yeah. the the fact i think in a lot of cases it's easier to kill deer on public land <laughs> well and, and i guess that's where it, it, it all comes back to what are your expectations as a hunter right because there's a in a weird way, and I say this lightly because it's this is airing whatever December fourteenth or something. Like, I almost don't want to kill a deer on opening day because then what the hell do I do in that state for the rest of the year? If I kill my buck in Ohio on opening day, then I'm just on the sidelines through some of the prettiest time of the year during the rut, everything. Now I say that now in December where I'm like, well, shit, man, I got to fill a tag here pretty soon, <laughs> but. But I also, like, when you're out hunting public, are you doing it because you're going to kill the first one or two-year-old that comes by? And if that makes you happy, great. But if you're going to continue to talk about challenge and growth as a hunter, like, at some point, it's not just the challenge against other hunters in the area as much as it is the quality of deer that you're chasing. Yeah. Well, I, I think at least th that's the challenge that we're advocating for. Like, I don't want anybody to have to fight. No, I hate against, it, man. Against other people. Like, that's not it's hunting. Not fun. That's not hunting. That's not fun. We had a guy, in, and I say this because we had a guy, Corey, who, when we were in Illinois, uh, parked at a public area. There were other trucks there, right? <laughs> Still well before daybreak. And he he's was a, he's a young hunter, mind yeah, you. Young hunter. First public land experience. But eager. And so we, we had a stand set pretty deep in the timber. He gets, what, 150 yards from his car, and this dude flashing lights, cussing at him, blah, blah. And, like, that doesn't, that's not good for anybody. Not good for us as hunters. Not good for those two in that situation. Not good for non-hunters who think, yeah, that's the representation that we see out there. That's, well, what, that's what it's like for me on private land around here. That's what I say. I mean, depending yeah. on your situation, like around here – and we're like, we got 180 acres, but the land around here is so fragmented and the bucks around here travel so far. Um, I, yeah, I mean, if people from around here are listening to this, they might look at me a little sideways, but I, if, if your goal is to kill a mature deer around here, I think in a lot of instances, it's easier to do that on public because if you're willing to walk a little bit further, mm. work a little bit harder, like you can have a whole mountain to yourself. Yeah. Dude, that, that fragmentation of land, I think is if not one of the, the biggest factor for, you know, white tails able to grow to maturity, you know, we Agreed. see in States like Pennsylvania, just as an example, because we live here, the land is so fragmented, it's hard to find a piece, you know, bigger than 20, 30, 40, 40 acres. Most of them are that you get out just even across the line, Eric, to Ohio. Um, and immediately you start to see bigger tracts of land, you know, it's old pasture ground or, or farms and stuff. Yeah, but 100, 200, 300 acre farms. Yeah. And even if there are as many hunters, um, inherently those deer are going to have a better opportunity because they've got more, you know, habitat to, to hide in. That's what I've experienced anyways. That seems to be the biggest difference between PA and Ohio f for me. It's deer space. Parcel yeah, size. Thing about, I mean, to some people maybe listening to this podcast today, you know, it might be, you know, like, where are they going with all this? We'll have you, you know, on again too, Eric. We don't have to like solve anything today. <laughs> we don't no, have to solve it no, all today. No. no, I appreciate that. But no, it's just, you know, you hear this conversation and the thing is, is we, I mean, we've had a healthy debate about this. And the thing is, is this is just the tip of the iceberg, mm. gentlemen. We're going to have to dive in deeper on this here in the next couple of years, because it's getting, it's not getting better. It's getting worse and not, and, and, and it's getting worse, but let's not look at it negatively. You know, mm -hmm. let's we got to start having these discussions on public land versus private. And what do we do and how do we how do we feel? How do we if you're stuck on a public ground uh, and it's crowded and there's not good quality whitetails, 
do you still press on? Do you still have the energy to go on and be that person that you want to be? Do you still strive? Or do you just walk away from the sport? Please don't walk away from the sport. We need you. We well, need you yeah. financially. Think- we need you for all this stuff. So if that's the thing, it's like we sit there and pound on each other versus crossbows, bows, whatever, pick a subject that we have debate on, healthy debate on. Some people just throw their hands up and they walk away. I don't want you walking away. Yeah. You know, we got to figure this out. We have to figure this out. And we're, but to have, I mean, how many people actually have this discussion that we have today? I was sitting there listening to everybody and it's like, I, you know, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts and stuff like that. So I, I can't say this out loud, but I, who's discussing this? Nobody. Nobody's talking about it. To have discussions like this. And that's why we need to prop each other up, public man versus private. Sure. A rabbit hunter. I don't rabbit hunt, but bam, brother, I got your back. Yeah. You know, that's what the discussion needs to be to start because we're going to fall with the the world is changing and hunting is changing and how we're going to pay for hunting. And we got to be united. And we'll have this, we have this, the 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 jokingly discussion later, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put personal issues aside for a second, but we're all on the same team. And the thing is, is every time we lose somebody, man. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's why, like, I'm in a kind of a unique position personally in that, you know, I look around this room and, and some of the 150, 160 inch deer, I got a booner at home. I'm actually kind of in the reverting standpoint. And I say that lightly because don't get me wrong. I still want to contribute can you know kill mature bucks i still want to hunt giant deer but because i've got a nine-year-old and a six-year-old um my focus has been to basically get them in the deer i don't care what they are and and use that property and teach them proper management and run cameras and because of that and i'm 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 slowly coming to the i'm okay with it realization is that the chances of me killing Boone and Crockett deer on my Kentucky place or my soon to be Ohio place probably aren't good. Um, but that's okay because I need to bring them into the hunting community any way they want, right? No pressure. Hey, you can't shoot this. In fact, my oldest has killed, um, he killed a four point with a gun last year. It's his only deer he killed. This year, his younger brother killed a four point with a crossbow. We we're sitting in the in the blind, and uh, during gun season, Pennsylvania button buck comes out. And I was like, "All right, man." I was like, "Just right behind the shoulder, squeeze it." He's like, "Well, it's a button buck." I was like, "Yeah, it's okay." I was like, "You got a doe tag, you're fine." He's like, "Well, I don't want to shoot it." I'm like, "Really?" He's like, "Yeah, no, no, I don't like uh, that'll be a buck next year. Like, I'd rather wait for a doe." And like, I have no. Pr- in fact, I was encouraging them to drop the damn thing, right? But <laughs> but it, and it's because that's how I grew up. It didn't matter. Like if it was antlerless season, that deer was dead. And so, you know, and it, it, in one way I was a little bit proud of them. I'm like, okay, like you're paying attention. Like you're in the other way. I'm like, well, am I raising him correctly? Like, why does he want to pass that? Is it because he doesn't want to shoot a fawn? Is it because he thinks dad will be mad? He shot a button buck. Like there's all these things going through my head. And it's like, you know, ultimately it's his decision, you know, and he was happy with it and we've moved on from there. But there's part of me that starts to think like, maybe he just hears me talking and it's like, yeah, like so-and-so shot this buck and like, I can't believe he did it. And I don't know, you know, so. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's it. So that's what, like, I'm kind of in a weird position where I'm used to hunting and really hunting a specific deer, not even like, oh, I'm going to go for a mature buck. Like I've got a buck in mind and that's where my season goes. I'm trying to kill that one deer. We're talking about kids and them picking up on uh, things. And you said uh, a key thing there. Well, dad be, you know, uh, disappointed in me, even though he says, drop it. Yeah. You know, certainly. And kids today are a lot smarter than we were, I, mm-hmm. I feel. Still uh, are. For example, I just remember uh, one time, you know, from my son listening to me talk on the phone with clients, me walking around the house practicing a seminar, what I wanted to say, uh, you know, all that stuff. He picked up on that. And I never sat down with my son and said, Hey, this is X, Y, and Z yeah. here. Yep. You know? Same. Um, and I remember him having a friend. You remember those uh Cabela's, I think, had it, those Hunter Dan toys, oh, you yeah. know, the deer and yep. hunter and all that yep. stuff. Four wheeler right? and everything. Yep. Yeah, he had his uh friend over, and next thing you know, I look up and they're I mean, they're actually fist fighting. And I went over there going, What are you doing? And he goes, you know, I forget the kid's name. Jimmy, Jimmy killed the two-year-old and my son, he had the baby buck. 
you know, he shot the baby buck and the little Jimmy shot the, t- the two. My son's yelling at him and they got in a fist fight over it. That my it's like, okay, whoa. Oh, yeah. What am I doing here? Yeah. You know, like, oh my gosh. So that is a that's a negative, you know. Um, it is, man. It's scary to me too, because like I um because there was no pressure from my family, it was the deer camp quote atmosphere. You know, I think it made me into a better hunter because I frankly could do whatever I want within the legal bounds. I hunted all the time. I shot a ton of does. I killed button bucks. I killed spikes. Like, and then, you know, as I grew, I just changed my expectations. But my kids are entering a world where expectations are already super high. And so I'm almost trying to force a, a regression there. To be like, no, like, guys, let's go back to this camp mindset. And we've done it. We've had camps in Kentucky. We've had camps even in our own house in Pennsylvania to the point of, like, let's just have fun and do this right. And, like, if you see a uh, – because there's no antler restrictions for youth. You see a spike you want to kill, kill it. Like, do it. You know, and I'm I'm trying to support them in that decision versus force them to shoot something that they don't want. And it's a weird thing because, you know, when we grew up, I mean, you killed a spike and you prayed it around town. Now it's like, well, you know, I had eight or nine one-year-old bucks, basket rack bucks on 28 acres in Pennsylvania. You know, which one do they shoot? Or do yeah. they shoot them? I don't know. Um, the youth thing is very, it's going to be, I mean, Cody and I with the Deer Hunter Project, we always talk about, you know, the most uncomfortable thing for a sportsman to do is to do something outside his comfort zone, you know, step outside the box. And we're going to have to change. We're going to have to, for us to continue this conversation, to have the freedom to have this conversation, we have to do uncomfortable things. Right, Cody? I mean, it's just, we're going to have to start changing and changing the narrative of stuff. Is it more important for your kids, my son, your guys' kids in the future and stuff or whatever. I mean, is it more important for them to shoot a deer or understand standing about it? Now I want my, my grandkids and all that stuff in the future to hunt and, and go with grandpa. But as long as they understand it, we're coming to that world Mm -hmm. where that's going to be more important. You know, when they get 18 and in the voting booth and issues just because they don't trap, will they make the right decision? And who's that going to fall on? Mm -hmm. That's going to fall on us. Because look at the examples that your, your 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 kid and my son and stuff listening to us. You know, if they have a bad experience with it, you know what? They're not going to make that wise scientific decision. And that is what the future is that we have to start doing. And it's it's so hard to focus on killing a, a mature white-tailed deer and spending money on management and all that stuff and have that in the back of your head. You know, you know, we're, we're there's so much to manage other than white-tailed deer here. Sure. You know, we got to manage the human, our own mental uh, demons and everything else on top of it. You know, so it's not, you know, people say, why you deer hunt? You don't have enough time in the world to understand, you know, just to listen. Well, and I will and say, I think from the QDM, whether it's QDMA or QDM aspect or however you look at the management thing, the one thing that, that has changed me and I think for the better with it is the amount of time. And again, it, per pressure, who knows, but the amount of time I spend on land management, wildlife management, deer management in a given year, right? It used to be small time scouting, hunting season, and then it's dead. It's done. Like I don't, you don't do anything else. That's how I grew up. Now it's very much full year. I'm thinking about it. Some aspect of it, shed hunting, uh, timber stand improvement, food plots, cameras, whatever. Like it is, it is, I've built my life around it and my kids are building their life around it. And I love that aspect because it's the outdoors, which is what I've always wanted to be in. I mean, I think it, I think it kind of paints a clear picture of like, like QDM is obviously good for the deer. You know, it's, it gets them to an age of maturity. It gives them habitat where they can thrive, but it's, you know, it's not really catering to to the human element, you know, and, and how, you know, especially access and, and all of these things, which is proof that the two are frankly at odds. I mean, it's a, it's a limited resource, but we want everyone, you know, to be able to enjoy these. And so there's like a balance that's got to be somewhere in the middle to where it's like, 
you know. Well, and we have to be the ones that make the balance. Nobody else is going to make that decision. States aren't going to make that decision for us. Like, the sportsman has to make the balance. That's it. But you can't do it on public land. Yeah. I mean, I, I've i said this, and Cody and I have said this a lot. I mean, we, everything is, I hate to say this cliche, everything is happening, it happens for a reason. There is a reason, and I've said this some other times, is there's a reason why you were introduced QDM. Yeah. There's a reason why you embraced it. And you look at the, that you knock down ceilings with, with the knowledge of quality or management. It opened up your world, especially if you were the person that took the blinders off. And, and learned about bluebirds and this and that. Well, look what it created. There was a reason why you walked down this road. There's a reason. And this reason is to, to be able to have, have educated discussions and, and push us to the future the right way, where, well, where we can have educated debate, where when we're sitting at the table here, there's educated words being said. Mm-hmm. And that, that reason is because you learned all this stuff. You went through stripe. You learned you, you you didn't kill big deer. You didn't do that. You know, you know all about it. You know how to handle these situations. You know, and uh yeah. Well, I mean, that's the hard part now. I mean, from a youth standpoint, is you know, and it's not everywhere, but there's a chance like with this new Ohio farm I have, I could put my six year old in a blind with me and the first sit, a boon and crocodile deer could walk out in front of them. It's a chance. Not a chance when I lived and grew up like that. Like there was maybe a chance we saw a buck, but likely not. But now, like, how do you, how do you train him? And and let's say it happens, where do you go from there? Cody, younger <laughs> version, man. Let's hear it. I don't know. I mean, for me, it's um, it it, it all goes back to what you value, and you know, in QDM and and hunting mature deer, there's you know, I think a lot of people confuse QDM with, with trophy deer management. If you say, yeah, I practice QDM, then you assume the main goal is to, you know, kill a mature deer. And that certainly is the case for a lot of people. And, you know, if, even if you have multiple goals, that's usually one of them. Um, but like for me on my property, you know, I kind of went through a spell where, you know, I, I go after this, the biggest deer that we had. And one year my brother killed him. One year I would, the neighbor would, years two, three, and four, and then kind of realize like, you know, the chances of me being consistently successful doing that are pretty slim. Mm-hmm. Like, is it going to happen? Sure. I mean, it might happen more often than not. There'll be a spell where it happens, where it happens very rarely. So what are you going to do, you know, in the meantime to make sure that this lifestyle is still meaningful and, you know, providing value and, you know, fulfillment to your life. And, you know, if killing a big deer is the only metric by which you measure success within the QDM, the QDM lifestyle, then it's, you know, you're going to fail more often than not. So in the middle of all that, like find little wins, you know, find other things that you can value, you know, taking a kid out. Um, for me, it's managing habitat, um, mm-hmm. you know, managing non-native invasive species, killing does. I, I keep track of all the weights we kill on deer and, you know, the ages of them. So like, you know, a deer that I killed, like a three-year-old doe I shot in 2012 might have field dressed, you know, 80 pounds. Now they might feel dressed 90 pounds. Like to me, that's that's pretty cool stuff. That's something I have control over. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have that much control over killing the biggest deer in the woods around here because they travel so far and there's so much gun season. And, you know, you just, you kind of learn to roll with the punches. But, um, you know, the biggest thing for me is like, you know, just learning and figuring out what you can control and finding value in that. And that's different for everybody. I mean, that might be, you know, if you guys want to go out and shoot a two-year-old and that like makes you happy, like do it. And the thing is, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, like Eric said, yeah, I want to, I want to go out and shoot a two-year-old, but I don't want, you know, I wonder what people will think of me. Like we don't, you don't have to tell anybody. Like you don't have to post a picture sure. to the internet of a two-year-old. That you shut you your dirty mouth, mister. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's the thing. He like, just sold you, you know, out. He did shoot it. <laughs> yeah, Eric, show it. Show us that rack. I know it's sitting wow. behind you. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I love what you said there, Cody. It's really interesting to see how different people respond to like when you're faced with like a, a challenge like that or a realization of like, hey, this property is is this we realize this now Mm -hmm. my uncle and i are are at odds and and so my uncle is like uh, one of my biggest inspirations for getting into bow hunting and he's the reason that i want to kill you know a big antler deer with a bow like that was his thing 
And so now he and I hunt the same uh, track of ground in Ohio. And we've come to the realization that like, hey, it's really hard to get bucks to four years old and older, you know, and, and we have a couple of them every year. And he and I's response have been different. And there could be so many reasons for that. He, he's much older than I am and he's 50, 56, 57. I'm 28. You know, maybe it's an energy level thing. Maybe it's just a difference in personality. But like he's taken your approach of like, okay, I realize the property is this. So I'm going to take what the land gives me and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, not a direct, in a derogatory sense, I'm going to lower my standard and try to, you know, kill one of these three-year-old bucks, you know, because I'm just I'm more about the antler size. That's that's what I'm looking for and the age is not as important. That's kind of what my, where my uncle's at with the thing. And that's great. That's, fi- that's fine. I want him to be able to do that. Um, but from my end, and it's not because of any social pressure, but believe me, I just, I just love white tail deer and I love to see what they can turn into. And so for me to, to go out and kill a two year old buck and, and believe me, I've had a lot of them in front of me two three year old, buck, even, you know, uh, you know, whatever. And I've thought about if I killed those things and I'm like, all right, so what if I, if I shot that thing, what does that, what does that do for me? And there's nothing wrong with anybody wanting to, to kill those. That, if that's fun for you, that's gr- I I want you to do that. But I just know that for me, at the end of that experience, I'm going to have a dead two-year-old buck that wasn't what I set out to, to do, you know, and isn't going to fulfill me in a way that, you know, all this time and money that I put into it, it was f- to achieve my goal of killing a, a mature buck. You know, an- antler size is, is important, but it's age is more important for me. And so my response to on this property has been acknowledging that it, it may not be possible as frequently as I want it to be. So I went out and, and started hunting somewhere that it, that I could, you know, and I was successful at doing that this year. Yeah. I think the, well, the, the mindset on that too, and this is where I'm at right now is that like more often than not to, to Cody's point is I'm going to be ending the season with my pocket full of tags unfilled. And I'm okay with that. Like, I don't, I don't feel the need to fill a buck tag every year. That doesn't like me shooting any buck just doesn't like, I I don't need that sacrifice. You're willing to do one thing too, is that we, I know we're pressed for time here, but it's one thing that we left and people leave out and they they did have a big spurt at one time as QDM Mm co-ops, you know, especially like in Ohio. I mean, there was 16, uh, different type of QDMA branches and, or uh, co-ops and yep. I traveled all over, created these to help create these things and stuff. And, you know, that's when people started, you know, joining forces and, and, and the, the, the harvest of older class whitetails went up when people work together, but it, it never gets discussed anymore. No, this QDM philosophy or QDM co-ops. But here's the thing. I remember one time uh, I went to a co-op meeting and these guys are probably year four, year five. And um, it was like, I think a post, no, it was a pre-meeting um, where the season, a meeting just before the season. And uh, I had a, a gentleman come up to me and goes, hey, uh, Stretch, could you, could you t- tell everybody that, um, you know, we need to stop shooting these uh, two and three-year-olds. We need to, we need to jump up the, the ladder, if you will. I said, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say something, trust me. Yeah. So in a meeting, I, I, I ripped ass. Like, you can't do that. How do we get to the top of a roof? We put a ladder up and we climb. Now, knowing that the, there's a big group, some people can have the ability to skip up a couple rungs, you know, and that uh, example, that guy who came to me. But if you're trying to accomplish something, you got to remember the guy who's halfway up and is scared of heights. Yep. You know, they're your brother or sister. Mm-hmm. You, they're part of our family. And if they're shooting two year olds a year and a half or whatever, but they're still managing and stuff, man, we're, we're all family here. Yeah. It's like, but at the same time, if you want to shoot older class white tails, you can't shoot those two and three. Well, that's olds. the thing. You can't be a hypocrite. You can't go no, out. No, 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 no. That's what thing. I was yelling at both sides. Yeah. Like, you know, we need to come to a balance here. You can't judge either way. We're, we're, we're a unit here. We're doing great things. Mm-hmm. Let's, everybody is at their own pace. And you have to respect that. Well, and I Cody, think he's shooting spotted fonts. That's what he right, likes to do. Right. Yeah. 
just knocking the milk right off the lips. Um, I, you know, I think in, in the, again, the human aspect of this is, is extremely difficult to manage, but what everybody, regardless of your stakeholder position in this thing has to realize is white-tailed deer, the herd is very plastic. It's able to bounce back very quick. The fact that you kill a 160 inch three-year-old. Yeah. Maybe to the guy who really said, man, that, that was the future 200. That sucks, you know, and that deer doesn't come along every day, but it does come back from that. Um, and so that one deer doesn't make a big difference. It's the consistency of it. And there are certain properties in certain areas, and Jared and I have hunted in these places, where if the only deer you're seeing are three years old, and you're not seeing any deer older than that, you either need to move or you need to manage your expectation because you alone are not going to get deer to the four and five year old age class. It ain't going to happen. If you walk into a property, for instance, the 20 acre golden piece in Ohio, and you in October, November are seeing four and five year old bucks, you got yourself something special. And the odds are, unless something significantly changes around there, you will continue to see those four and five year old bucks. But you know, my, my take on it is like, I've got 28 acres behind my house in Pennsylvania. I've seen one deer, maybe four years old. Everything else has been three and under. So when I see a three-year-old, if I'm looking to fill a buck tag in Pennsylvania, I better shoot that deer because I'm probably not going to see anything older than that. And that's the reality of it. You know, and anybody can say, well, if you passed him, he would have been four, not by history, not what I'm seeing. Well, cool guys. Listen, I think to your point, ultimately, that discussion is very tip of the iceberg, but are the types of discussions that need to happen. I'm sure we'll get some comments uh, that are pleasant. I'm sure we'll get some comments that are not pleasant, but ultimately somebody's got to say this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really well said. That's kind of what, you know, Eric and I do with the Deer Hunter Project. We, we, we talk about a lot of stuff and the main thing, you know, a lot of the conversations that we have on our podcast are kind of like this, where we just, we kind of float an idea out there and then kind of try to anyway, try to attack it from as many sides as we can. Um, you know, a lot of things we, we feel a certain way about, but you know, on, on other topics, like we, more than anything, we just try to get people to think. So we might say something that we might not fully believe, but it's like Eric said, you know, and a, a reason a lot of people think that we come across come across as angry or disagree with a lot of our stuff is, you know, we're, we're just trying to plant a seed, you know, in, in your mind and get you to think about hunting and wildlife and conservation like a certain way, because, you know, as a community, I think we get such tunnel vision, especially deer hunters, because it's always, you know, what can I do now to kill a deer? What can I do in the spring to plant a food plot, this, that, and the other? I'm just as guilty as everybody else. And then you, you forget about the bigger picture, which Eric has so much experience with, you know, working for the division and, and consulting and being as old as he is mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what we, <laughs> yes thank you that's what we try to do is just try to get people to think which i think you know, you know you so wise a really good job of it you know just now is just making a lot of good different points trying to get people to think about different things a little differently yeah yeah we I'm enjoy that too. just a lot sorry go ahead i said i'm just a younger shane mahoney mm, <laughs> there you go yeah i'm like a badass look at me well i mean cody we, we definitely enjoy just the conversation i mean we're not coming at this from any perspective other than our own personal experiences mm -hmm. like obviously we're not advocating or lobbying for for any group we just you know it's their fun conversations for us to have and and you know we're passionate about um certainly the white-tailed deer herds and, and also um, our fellow hunters, mm -hmm. uh, but, and we have, I think, conflicting ideas even internally as to like how those two things, um, work the best together. And like, there's, there's some hard answers and, and definitely some unanswered ones. Uh, yeah. There and, as well. and prove us wrong. You know, I, I we'll be the first to say, we don't know everything, but somebody has got to have that discussion. Somebody has got to talk about that stuff to even come close to saying, you know, Hey, Jeremy, I disagree with you for these reasons. Cool, man. I didn't even know those, that standpoint existed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I think at the end of the day too, we all acknowledge that a lot of different people hunt for a lot of different reasons yes. and each one of us would absolutely love and, and give up probably some things for each of those different demographics of people to be able to, to hunt the way that they want to hunt or achieve the, the goals that they have with, with hunting. 
but the reality is it's it's a limited resource and you know it's a, a lot shared of, resource it's a shared resource and a lot of people want to use it a lot of different ways and certain people have different resources like land and like money where they can uh manipulate it so that they get the, the best outcome that, that they want out of it and that's just kind of the way that it is um you know all that to say i think we want everybody to be happy with with mm. the state of hunting and i'm sure there's some people that aren't but that's what's the conversation is about yep mm. agree well guys we appreciate you coming on today and and we'll be sure to loop you back in i know we just in that little pause there we we're talking about maybe getting at ata we're gonna have a podcast booth set up at ata so it'd be a good one in person to sit down and kind of continue these discussions and you know who knows maybe rope some people in in the industry to make them uncomfortable <laughs> yeah well, Eric, yeah, we got a open invite. I'm too. really good at making people. <laughs> we, we got an open invite to you guys, obviously to ATA, but um, you know, Eric, you're you're fairly close to where uh, my farm is at, and what Jeremy just bought a farm too, um, like in eastern central Ohio. But where we're at here is not too far from either, just a couple of hours. So we should find a way to make that happen at some I thought point. Thought you were trying to get a free consulting gig. I'll take that if you're coming out. <laughs> if you're coming out, point and shoot. I'm sorry, the internet broke up. Point, uh, point, yeah, yeah. point and shoot. <laughs> Fr free? I'm no, sorry. Absolutely, brother. What's that? Free? What? <laughs> oh man, I'm uh, I'm pretty easy to get along with. Yeah. I just like we walking properly. Well, apparently you need another place to hunt in Ohio too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. Uh, well, we appreciate yeah. it, guys. Well, I tell you what, I'll charge a, I'll charge a turkey hunt. How about that? Yeah, there you go. Fair enough. I don't care about turkeys. You can have all of them. Yeah, see? Uh, oh my god. Yeah. See. You, you know, know what's funny? You found a good one. You know what's funny, dude? There's a guy that owns a, quite a bit of property just down the road from us, and there's giant deer on it, and he doesn't give a shit about them at all. He just want he just turkey hunts, and I just can't. I cannot wrap my mind my mind oh, around the worst that. thing. The worst thing that God could ever do to me, well, a lot of things make me deaf so I can't hear a gobble, man. I mean, it's just, oh, that's, that's, my, that's my crack. All right. I here's my, my, uh, my closing sentiment <laughs> on this podcast here. My dad takes out a guy every year on our farm that's like 96 or 97. He's extremely old. And uh, he's been hunting with him for, for years and years. And so I can remember when I was a kid, he was already, you know, deaf and halfway blind. And uh, we were set up with these turkeys coming in, just gobbling their heads off. There's like three or four of them. And uh, I look over and the guys, we call him Pappy. He stands up and starts walking over to us. And he's like, let's get out of here. He's like, there's no birds here. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? I was like, they're right there, like a hundred yards on the ridge. He's like, what? <laughs> Dude, that's going to be me and Cody. I'm going to be like, Cody, I peed my pants again. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then he's just going to set you out on a point and walk away for, for a while. Like that now. He's going to say, hold this fan and just start gobbling away on this thing. <laughs> oh. oh, Cody could tell some stories like the Uber story is how disconnected i am with reality and oh, being yeah. that's a but whole other episode yeah oh yeah Let's talk about a generational gap i got i got to take care of the old man oh, i know yeah. man you want to know what the deer hunter project is it's bringing eric up into the 21st century <laughs> <laughs> he's like he's like you mean when you connect to the internet it doesn't make that dial-up sound anymore <laughs> that's right go to www.deerhunter.com <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, guys, we appreciate coming on. We'll for sure loop you back in, whether it's at ATA or, or even just in another call-in. But um, appreciate the insight. Uh, make sure everybody check out the social media and YouTube pages for the Deer Hunter Project, D-E-A-R. And, uh, yeah, man, keep us updated on things that come from you guys. Absolutely. Thanks appreciate lot, guys. it. Right, we'll guys, see you guys. So thank, thank you. Thanks. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, – I'm sure – as always, there'll be people that say they don't like us, but that's cool because I like that stuff. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, you got to talk about it. There, there, there are a lot of things happening in this industry, um, and frankly, not all of them are good. And and I'm not saying that they're that I disagree with them or I shun them because they're bad. But you know, when we get to this point of like hunters hating hunters or these people saying it's not as challenging as these people, or it's like, oh, you're spoiled, you own land, like you should try public hunting, and it's like. Dude, don't be so quick to, to judge the book by its cover. Like ultimately, like we're all deer hunters. We're all passionate about certain things, you know, whether it's the hunt, the management aspect of it, all of it. Um, I think it's a really interesting discussion point when you get into the, why do you hunt? And I think it's harder to answer 
than most people think. I think you'd have people quick to say, well, yeah, like, of course I love whitetail. It's just this. But it's like, no, no, no. Like, why Why do you love hunting whitetails? It's really easy to look at it on the surface and for somebody to say, oh, that guy's a trophy hunter or that guy hunts for meat or, you know, even that guy hunts because he's part of a, a hunt club or something. But I do think it's it's much deeper than that. Like, there's there's a spiritual element to it. For sure. There's a heritage to it. And there, everybody brings their own, you know, taste to it. That's, that's I think, what's kind of sad about, um, like, the conflict that there is between hunters is that every, everybody's, you know, coming from a different standpoint on it. You know, had different influences. Um, they had a different uh, level of opportunity, mm-hmm. you know. And that's not, it's not fair, but it is, it is what it is. And so, like, now at today's day and age, you've got, You've got this, you know, and I can tell Eric's like burdened himself with. Well, I mean, Eric is in the same position. The disagreement of hunters across the nation, you know. Eric's in a position that that I had been in for a long time. It's frustrating. I'm not necessarily in it anymore, but like, you know, we were paid consultants. So guys didn't call us to say, hey, how do I have fun hunting? No, no, no. They called you in to grow the biggest bucks possible and have the best hunting uh, property possible. And that was fun. But it also came with an immense amount of pressure because if I'm out there lecturing a guy on passing these three-year-old 160-inch deer to get him to four, like what does somebody think about when I kill a three-year-old? You know, and that stuff weighed heavy for a long time. Still does, frankly, because, you know, you don't want to be called a hypocrite out there. But the the fact is, is like, uh, you know, when I did most of my consulting, shit, I was hunting public land. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I'd go out there and I was passing two and three year olds on public land because if I didn't kill a four year old, like how does my clients make that seem? And it's, you put yourself in such a position to where it's like, Whoa, wait wait a minute. Gut check for a second. You're not them. Like just because you're advising them on what to do, their situation is a hell of a lot different than your situation. And it took a while to get back that. And, and even now where I'm at, whether it's with Hunter podcast or stone remedia and all the things that we do, like, again, as I said in that, I'm kind of regressing now because of the kids to where, like, I need to bring that fun back into hunting. And, yes, I surely want to kill a big mature buck, but also I don't want them to feel that pressure because it's not fun. You know, if I put that on myself, that's because that is my challenge. But for them, I just want them to be like, Dad, take me hunting because it's fun. Or Harlan says, hey, let's go shoot a squirrel in the head because it's fun. But, like, if I if I don't act very carefully – I could corrupt that in them, and that may make them say, like, yeah, I don't want to hunt anymore, and I don't want that. Yeah. that That's a whole other challenge, man, the having kids. Like, I, I can understand why you're regressing in that that aspect. I just, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's why <laughs> I, I was a kid once. I can remember, like, what I felt, and, you know, frankly, I don't I don't think that anything that my, my dad did, like, necessarily – ruined or, or made hunting for me. I, mm-hmm. I can remember some cool, th- like he and I did an elk hunt together and stuff. I think and- it was easier. I know we have a gap in age, um, you know, nine years or whatever, but I think it was easier when we grew up versus kids now who are walking into this, uh, let's be honest, it's a big buck culture. This, yeah. this industry is a big buck culture. Mm-hmm. When we grew up, it was just a hunting culture still. Yeah. Um, and so now like these kids are entering the big bucks. I mean, You see kids like we saw, we talked about Drew, Bill's kid. Um, You see guys like Mason, Waddell's kid. Like these kids can't go kill a spike. They can't. Hmm. Can't do it. Like they were brought into a culture of like visibility and big bucks. And uh, I don't think that's easy on them, which, you know, I I don't know if Bill would agree or disagree, um, but could be the reason why Drew and Jordan don't hunt anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, in fairness, I, I can't ever recall feeling pressure to shoot a certain deer until I started watching Midwest Whitetail. And that's when the big butt culture, and that's no knock to Bill, because I mean, right. I love it. I live that aspect in my own life now, but it's, and it's, I think you, because of where you are and not with children, can continue down that pathway. With child. With child. <laughs> You're not with child, are you? Be on the stick. <laughs> Uh, whereas my kids are now into that hunting age where it's like, yeah, like we love making food plots. We love doing trail cameras. We love seeing big bucks, but I also will never ask them to pass a deer if they don't tell me first, which is why that whole button buck situation like blew my mind. I'm like, Hey man, like Mm -hmm. get on it. And he's telling me he's passing. And it's like, 
what? Yeah, it's definitely very different. Like, and there probably was some pressure for me at some point to try to kill a big buck. But to be honest, man, I just, I just got to that level pretty quickly. Not a level. I just, for some reason, I just skipped a bunch of like, I didn't need to kill a bunch of deer. I, it probably was the influence of my uncle and stuff. I could see he, it comes from he somewhere. had nice bucks on his wall. And so I just very, at a young age, I just wanted to kill probably first big antler deer. And then after learning about age structure and a lot of that came from my ingestion of Midwest whitetail, you know, it's a mm -hmm. great resource. I, I was like, Oh, cool. You know, not only is, um, you know, maturity of whitetails, um, a big factor in antler size, but it's also a, a much more sustainable goal. You know, I think B Bill is somebody who advocates for, you know, hunting a mature deer, mature deer. over hunting big antler deer. a big antler deer because, yeah. um, y you know, what do you do after you shoot a two year old, a three year old, a four? You, you can't, can't, can't keep climbing that ladder. That's mm -hmm. not possible. Mm -hmm. Or a 150, a 160, a 170. You can't do it. So once you reach a certain level of like, let's call this species, it's, it's peak level of maturity that also correlates a lot with peak antler sizes, you know, four or five, six years old. Um, you know, I th that's a sustainable goal. So year after year after year in, you know, any state where it's possible and with any weapon within a given season, you know, I can go out and try to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. And it's freaking hard. It obviously, is. you know, I had tags in six different states this year and I killed one and I'm stoked about it. It, it, it is a, it's an interesting take on it. And, uh, again, people do it for different reasons, but that's our reason. And possibly because we think about it all year long too. So. And it's not possible everywhere. You can't, you can't just go out on your back 40 and, and PA and expect to kill a four year old buck every no. year. That's why I think that expectations is, is huge. So anyways, we appreciate you listening to this episode of Hunter Podcast with Eric Long and Cody Altizer. Um, some really cool discussions in there. Leave a comment, good or bad. We've got a cool one coming thinking. up. Let's tr drop a little, uh, who did you talk to yesterday that's coming on? Oh, I got John Eberhart. Eberhart's coming on? Eberhart's going to come on. Sweet. The To me, he's the the like the original saddle guy. He'll have an opinion on uh, you know this this old school style of mm -hmm. and, and how this whole pressure of big bucks and stuff has evolved. Yep. Yeah, yep, he, so, he was one of those guys that like probably in his forties, like they came out with like scent lock or maybe even fifties. He lives by the carbon, dies I by know. the carbon. Yeah, yeah. So Eberhard, I don't know if he'll be on this next one or the following one. We're working okay. on his schedule here, but um, yeah, that'll be a good one. Again, if you want the buck roar, uh, yeah, just engage with us comments. somehow, and we'll we'll just keep track of you yeah, guys. We'll send it to somebody. We'll send it to somebody. But we appreciate it. Episode fifty, and we'll see you next time. Later. It take me. Oh.